bum, 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 bum. Oh, good lord. Hello. Imperial Japanese Navy joining the Royal Navy. This is, this is an interesting discussion to get into. It is. I wonder who's going to be joining me tonight. I wonder. I hope it's good, sir. I'm sure, hopefully it's a good crowd. Hopefully it's a good crowd. Let's see. Let's see who's here. Hello. 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 Oh, where's my Ambrew? Where's everything else? Oh, good lord. So, hello. Now, yes, there, uh, I'm going to just answer one of the questions which is coming on straight away. There is a non-zero chance of zeros in the Mediterranean in this scenario. There is. Um, I had a look at some of the aircraft coming into service and their dates of entering service, and it was kind of interesting for me to put this all through because... Um, Technically, the A6M0 first flies in July 1940, is introduced in July 1940. So, how quickly do ships get out there? That would be that was an interesting thing. No sound. No sound? I'm sure there's sound. My mic's reacting. I've just been recording. Hello, Richard Gross. Hello, everyone. Put on some headphones and check to see if there's sound. Hello, everyone. Put on some headphones and check to see if there's sound. I can hear sound. I can hear sound. So I think there is sound. I think it's working. Alrighty then. So hello everyone. Hello. Did this get moved back 30 minutes? Yes it did. Because I was striving to finish something off. Um, It's going to sound really strange. I was doing the video for tomorrow. The Friday video. The, uh, the key chips video. I'm re-recording it. And I went. I can get this finished if I have another half hour. Or I'll have to come out here and record it tomorrow morning, finish it off, probably re-record it again knowing me, and that I won't have the whole day to move and pack boxes around. And so I thought, I'm going to be naughty, I'm going to move it back by 30 minutes, and I'm going to then get all my stuff done. And I I forgot, or I've got to do the five, mark, five minute mark. Hello, this is a live. Thank you for joining me. I'm very glad if you do like the live, but I will be talking with the chat while the live is going on. So, if you find that annoying in videos, if you don't like the interaction with the chat, or you don't like my interaction with the chat, that you know it's perfectly fine. There will be a long patrol for this video coming out in roughly two weeks' time. The long patrol, which should come out on Saturday, is to do with last week's live, and it is roughly two and up, two plus hours long. I think it's two and two and a half, two hours and ten minutes long. I'm not sure, maybe twenty minutes long. And yeah, I hope that's a good one. That's about uh, Admiral Badenberg. Um, it should be a fun one. And this one will come out in two in a week a week on Saturday. So it will come out on the twenty seventh of April. Okay. So it will be done. 
So hello nights again, everyone. Hello Peter Dawson. Hello Paul Amos. Hello Timmy Locker. Hello Shiva Shira. Hello Steam Richards. Hello Carl Gasberg. Hello Leslie Mitchell. Hello Michael Cooch. Hello Cody eighty five. And hello everyone who's chatting away. Um, hello Rudon. Hello Jack Ray, of course. Oh Jack Ray, thank you for the memberships. Thank you, DH99. And hello, Steve Rutherford. You can hear sound. Okay. <laughs> Don't go on guide, son. There is sound. Paul is usually reliable. Paul is usually reliable. Hello, BMW VM Williams. Hello, Frank Belmore. Hello, Mo's Revenge. Hello, everyone who's here. That's good. All right. So. Today's going to be a fun one. And it is going to be a fun one. Because it's when you had no second Sino-Japanese war. And Japan joined the Allies on, the 20, on June 25th, 1940. And the second Sino-Japanese war. Well... That starts in 1937. So if that hadn't... If that hadn't continued... And hadn't been part of it... Will things become interesting? Because you don't have the Japanese ground forces involved in China. They're probably still in Manchuria. Let's be honest. But they are not going to be in China. Now, this changes the relationship with America because, as well as that, when we're sort of getting into this, you have to think, well, will America be doing the same embargoes on Japan if they are not in China? Honestly, they might be trying to look for a reason, but I doubt they will be able to. So, America and Japan will have an uneasy relationship, but not an active war zone relationship. There is a difference. There is a difference going on. Now, I'm going to quickly grab some iron brew. But while I am, I am going to give you all, to look at, because it's important, a shameless book plug. Yeah? Yeah? We have the Shameless Book Log. Always good to have. Up. Come up. Now, where's my own brew? <sighs> I have to tell you all, this is a very sad time. This is literally the sole iron brew I have. The all the iron brew I have at the moment. And I have... Yeah. I, I, I'm going to go on a little bit sad with the Iron Brew, I have to say, because, um, you know, I have enough work coming through. I thought, well, I'll try and order some from Asda. None came from Asda. Okay, fine. I'll order them from the co-op. None came from co-op. I ordered something from Sainsbury's. Luckily, we did need bits of shopping, and because of my sister's gluten-free and my mum's allergies, we do tend to get bits from each of them. And it would have been more sensible to probably go driving around, but if I went driving around, then I wasn't able to record and move boxes, so I was doing the order thing. I was being lazy. All orders arrived, not a single bottle of iron brew. I walked up to the local corner shop. One bottle. One bottle remaining. So I have spent all the money in my account till next payday, so don't worry. But life happens. It's not as if I'm going to have massive bills between now and the 23rd before I next receive a check. So I think I'm okay. But uh, Although I haven't got the pizzas for Saturday. But I'll, I'll sort that one out. But what I mean is, I did all that and I still only got, only got one bottle of Iron Brew. So the lesson in that particular story, ladies and gentlemen, is A, I need to sell a lot more books to fund my Iron Brew habit. B, thank you to everyone who likes, shares, and subscribes, because if you didn't, I wouldn't be able to afford the books which do support this channel and support my book habit. And... Three, 
a sort of or C. The important thing is, it doesn't matter how mature you feel, it doesn't matter how smart you feel, we can all end up becoming a little bit blinded by wanting something. In my case, it was wanting some iron brew. Which made me volunteer to buy all the shopping. Shouldn't have done that. Or alternatively, I should have gotten the car and just driven to Asda. It probably would have saved time, and I might have found most of the things in Asda if I'd gone hunting around them, rather than using that online delivery system. But I tried. Anyway. <sighs> Corner shops are very convenient, but they, um, yeah, they literally, the, the, the person who runs the corner shop went, I have one bottle of Iron Brew. I went, it says, he says, every time you buy it, I go, I buy another bottle. It is... Oh, and it's not, we're now seeing each other on unrelated live streams. The, the, the community is growing. We're starting to include more people. <laughs> it's when you it's when we take over other live when other live streamers uh, other people's live streams get taken over by the community from this channel. That's when I will really la start laughing at it. Hello, Megastro. Yes, you did. You got a membership from Jack Ray. Yeah. Actually, no. Here is a serious thing before I get into tonight's video, and here's a serious question. I'm trying to track down for my mum the window buttons for a Volvo V70 because her buttons got chipped by the um, garage. And I don't think we can go back there to have them replace them. And so I need to find some buttons so I can give them to a mechanic who isn't currently trying to probably arrange emigration papers to him and arranging to emigrate to get away. <laughs> Don't scratch or damage my mother's car. I'm just going to leave that to one side. <laughs> I think that's a round. But anyone who knows, because ever I'm looking for, they're saying it's going to take about a month's delivery. And if I can get them in the next week, or specifically by next Tuesday, I can get them fitted by a mechanic who's going to be looking at the car anyway, and I don't have to do the job myself. And I really do not like the idea of taking the door off my mum's car and having to put the, uh, replace the buttons. Because if I make a single mistake, I will not be a living. Um, so... Any suggestions on where I can get these buttons from? Because it seems to me every all the Volvo dealerships I've gone to have gone. Oh, we don't stock those. Not for that, and not not for these seventies of that age. You see, it's really good condition. Yes, it's a Volvo. It'll run for frigging ever. Why are you not still stocking the parts and charging me an arm and a leg for them? That's what you usually do. Anyway, any suggestions? Please help. Uh, thank you for the help. So, first things first, if we're going to do today's discussion, we have to have some realism. And the realism starts with what actually exists in June 1940. And the first thing I have to tell you is, it ain't the Kido Butai. The Kido Butai does not exist. Do not start thinking mass Japanese carriers are going anywhere, okay? It's not. I'm going to expand this out so you can see, but it's not happening. Which model of V70? Uh, it's the full estate. Um, it's a 56 plate. So it's... 2000, uh, last, uh, 2005? Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. Aircraft carriers in existence. Hosho. Training carrier which could not operate the latest aircraft. Akagi, modernized in 1938. Not exactly the best thing known to mankind, but it will do. It will do. Uh, Kaga, in refit till November 1940. Hallelujah for someone. Uh, Ryujo, 1931, uh, in refit. Uh, refit finished in January 1940, working up to operational. 
Again, not the greatest carrier, let's be honest. No one really wants it anywhere near the North Sea, and certainly not. Uh, you might use it in the Mediterranean, but really, even in the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean, it's getting a bit rough for it. So, honestly, no. Uh, Soryu is in training. Hiryu is working up in 1940. He'd only been commissioned in 1939. The Shikoku class. Both vessels have been launched, but historically aren't commissioned until August, September 1941. Hiyo class, not even launched yet. Taiho has not even been laid down. Okay. Uh, capital ships. Uh, we have Congo, Hei, and Kirishima, and Haruna. Honestly, a mixed bag of ability. Hei had just come out of reconstruction in January 1940. The other three are, had all completed reconstruction earlier. On various states of refit, training commission, and transition. But let's be honest, they're all a nightmare for something called a Scharnhorst or a Graf... Uh, Scharnhorst or a Nisenau. Let's be honest, if you're a Scharnhorst Nisenau, you do not want to run into a Congo. They are fast enough to do a lot of damage to you. Fuzo and Yamashiro uh, have been ignored for about the last decade. Uh, whilst in 1995, Yamashiro may have served as the flagship of Combined Fleet... There is a reason she was being used for remote-controlled Kawanshi uh, E7K2 float planes in 1941. She's. This is one of the things when people start saying drones are something new. I go, look, they were talking about they were using remote-controlled float planes back in 1940s. Um, they've been working on this for a while. It's just taken a long time to become the level at which we're seeing it. Ezen Hyuga, well, in 1940, went for a major refit, as with the Nagatos. Nagatos, uh, well, in Nagato and Mutsu, whilst they did operate a Pacific October 1940 fleet review, there is a reason they spent 1941 having degaussing coils, armor, and other things fitted. They really didn't do much in 1940 and 41. And Yauto and Mashashi, well, they aren't launched till 1940. Uh, and that's August and November 1940. They're not commissioned until December 1941 and August 1942. So, I'm going to be sorry now. You are unlikely to get a Yamato versus Littorio matchup. It just ain't going to happen. You are unlikely to get a mass Japanese carrier force entering the Mediterranean. They just don't exist in this period, and by the time the war goes on, they will probably be uh, maneuvered around. There's also reality that some of those ships are just not suitable for Mediterranean and Atlantic operations. There, I just wouldn't want to take them. Ryojo, for example. I wouldn't want to take her into the Mediterranean. I would not want to take her into the North Atlantic. One is due to the sea. The other one is due to a combination of slightly the sea, but also the fact that it's really not designed for the level of, of combat which it might actually face. Capital ships. Basically, you have the Congos and the Gatos. That's it. That's what you can rely on. Um, it, it's... It's fun. And if you work down the cruisers, destroyers... The things carry on. You know, a lot of the fleet we associate with World War II Japanese Navy just doesn't exist in service in 1940 or doesn't exist at all. I am certain some Japanese heavy cruisers get sent. I am certain some other vessels get sent. But... <sighs> and there are going to be destroyer flotillas. There are all sorts of things integrated into fleets. But let's be honest. The big ticket items are going to be these. Destroyers coming into the an escort operations. Well, let's be honest. It's going to empty out the Indian Ocean. In the nicest way, there is going to be no... Uh, the whole problems in the Indian Ocean that happened historically in World War II just aren't going to happen. And so that's probably going to change things like the Indian famine. Because the famine is not going to... Ha if you are able to move... If you've got ships able to move freely backwards and forwards to goods. If you've got no attrition to ships. If you've got no Japanese Operation C and all those things. 
you don't have any of the issues which lead to the, those fleet problems. You also don't have the issues of Malaya. You don't have the inv invasion of French Indochina. There are all sorts of scenario things you don't have in this scenario. You don't have access to the Akazukis either. The Akazukis themselves only laid down in mid 1940. Yeah, I too. This is this is just a, so many of the things which we associate with the Japanese fleet in World War II do not exist in 1940. <laughs> it's just not the case. Um, go ahead, Hope. So oh, I presume that's to do with Mum's move of V40. I'm gonna do some chat stuff now. Um, yeah, honestly, don't don't go there. Do not go there. Um. My mum's currently having all sorts of fun at the moment, to, uh, trying to work out all sorts of things. She she's splitting her time between sorting out her car, sorting out the house, um, sorting out various things to do with Warhammer Forty K and various discussions with cousins. She's got to get. You know, I was talking the other day about the little cousin who has the whole ideas about potentially, you know, one of the Primarchs actually being a sister, and she worked all around. My mum has got all sorts of ideas which have developed from that, and there, there was a whole discussion about that at the end of the, I think it was the live on the brew ships on Sunday, and that was all discussion of sort of one of my little cousins' approach, because there did used to be, in the original generation of Space Marines produced models, some female Space Marines, etc. And then they developed the law and things changed, and well, you know, maybe they changed back. There's all sorts of scenarios. But anyway, um, the little cousin has those ideas. And so my mum's been working on that and her blood angels. And her her new joy of working out who her Oshi is or whatever that is. I think that's that's correct. Uh, we're getting this. This, this is life. <sighs> my mom, so does Japan have good coastal subs to send to Mediterranean? Japan has some very interesting submarines to send to the Mediterranean. And let's be honest, the Japanese, they're going to need some tech upgrades. They are going to need some tech upgrades, and the British will probably give them to them. Remember, I'm quite unappreciated for the Germans, UK, and Japan ranging into the Indian Ocean mattered. The Italians were also there. It's often forgotten the Italians also turned up in the Indian Ocean. I got. I know there is that. The, I'm not getting into the problems of that. That's my little cousin's discussion, and I, I did a full discussion the other day of my little cousin's ideas of it. But um, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just leaving that to that one side, um, Alan Gar. This is not a. This is not a Games Workshop stream. So as I said I'm just sort of bringing it up because people ask about what my mum was doing with her. Um, whether she was going to be sending her army of blood angels. My mother, the one person who um, ships Dante over Sanguinius. She's Dante forever. Actually, I bet on the Shanos over their, their sisters. But Deutschens are just going to cry. Well, the point is, it, what happens if it's the Congo is backed up by HMS Renown? This is a scenario. The Cong uh, HMS Renown and two Congos bump into a couple of Shan horse. Who's going to be having the fun? I'm curious now how Congo goes with no sign of Japanese war also. It's going to be funny if Yanosa comes out to play, but it's going to look up close. Yes, but the thing is, it's not going to come out to play till at least late 1941, if not 19... It's not commissioned until December 1941. The earliest the British are likely to see that ship in the European theatre is 1942. I'm glad, Archie. I'd like, I'm glad you'd like to know more. So, 
With that all being said, and there being no questions, and no one sort of really up, uh, upset about this, because this is the historical facts of what's available, let's start off with. Well, here's an interesting thing about June 1940. There is my favourite Japanese admiral of the entirety of World War II, probably the smartest Japanese admiral of this period, and the most honourable, the one who eventually has to be called in by the Emperor and is, of course, given a pen, or uh, given some writing influence by the Emperor, um, as a thank you for his service, Admiral Yonai, Mitsumasa Yonai. I have done an entire video about him on this channel because he's one of the most forgotten people of Japan, but he's probably one of the best. And actually, it's him who makes this possible because if you haven't got the other Sino the Second Sino Japanese War, Mitsumasa Yonai might well decide the best way to give. His people, the honor, the power, all this of the war fighting they want to let out the dragon, to let out their, uh, you know, the the the, the, the beast inside which wants to fight a war and get honor. Well, join the allies, fight on the British side, go and get victory. So, in this case, if he's prime minister, he's prime minister in this period, and Yonai, I could imagine him turning around in this circumstances, circumstances and making an announcement of, Whilst we realise the Washington Treaty and Naval Treaties have uh, replaced the alliances, and we are no longer a member of either treaty or the Washington, either treaty or alliance, we have fought with our friends before in the past, and we will fight with them again. We will go to Britain's aid. They have found themselves alone fighting the Italians and the Germans. And we as a fellow great power must go to their aid because that is what great powers and great allies do. da dee da dee da Now, the thing is, if he decides this, what does it do? Well, it firms up his position in power, for starters. It's going to be a naval war, so it's going to keep. Uh, so, as long as he can give some victories, an admiral is going to be use, uh, admiral's going to be in charge of it. It's going to firm up the moderate faction, because believe it or not, Yonai is pretty much the most moderate of the prime ministers you have in period, and one of the few who's powerful enough that. Well, how do I put it politely? Mitsumasa Yonai. Is notable for well the fact that you go through his history. He has the emperor's trust. He has a lot of people's trust, and he managed to avoid people trying to attempt to assassinate him. In fact, he's noted for being prompt and capable of organising things, of getting the army on side even on several occasions. This is... This is going to be fun. Now, if you've got Yonai, I can, as I said, his thought process, I think, would go like this. 
he's not in the Sino-Japanese War. He has managed. To, the army haven't got involved in that. They're not. They're not in this scenario at the moment. They have come out of the war with Russia, with the Soviet Union. But he can also see which way this is potentially going. He could end up finding himself fighting a war against the Soviet Union with the British as allies if the, British have if the Soviet Union has turned into their ally against the fascist powers. So he needs to head this off. He's got the freedom of manoeuvre, he's not in a war, and he can put, to point out the old alliance and he can give them victories. Let's be honest, he can tell the army, do you want to go practice your armoured warfare in a North America, a North Africa? Do you want to go and deploy troops to North Africa? Do you want to go and maybe deploy troops to other parts of the war that are going on? There are some very interesting scenarios for what he can do. And yes, there's the reality of fascist ideology, especially Nazi ideology. Uh, there's always a difference when you're dealing with the Italians versus the Germans, but uh, in terms of how they enact it, but that is a true that is true. That is an issue. That, uh, let me put it this way: that's less of an issue than you might think, because honestly, the ja they do they do historically become allies. So don't take this the wrong way, but the Japanese can, if necessary, hold their tongues and hold their noses and do the deal if they think it's a, if it's a, they think it's a sensible thing. But yeah. This is the one person in this circumstance where he hasn't got the Sino-Japanese war going on. And remember, this is a man who, when he's Prime Minister, one of the first things he does is take off his uniform. He insists as Prime Minister he wears a suit. And gets away with it. And again, go and look him up. Look up his career. Look at the fact that he's... Uh, the, one of the things I'm always shocked by is I, were, I, I look through his career and... He does all sorts of things and he gets into arguments with people but sorts it out. He's, they, they never attempt to assassinate him. He even puts down a rebellion... Without manage without people coming and taking him out. He is incredibly powerful. And there is a reason why when the war is over, the Emperor calls Yonai back to be the one to bring the fleet home. He is the only one with the authority, respect, and ability to bring the fleet home and get them to accept surrender. He has the Emperor's absolute trust. He was also consistently against the idea of War of America. Con Cameron, would a European war give him an excuse to send Hideki Tojo as commander of the North African Japanese army to get him out of the way? He could do. He could turn around to Tojo and go, we are sending troops to fight in North Africa in their first maneuver war. I want, it has to be an experienced general. The emperor cannot look bad in front of our allies. We are going to be fighting alongside the British. We are fighting alongside, you have to go and do a great victory. I could see him coming up ways to get rid of Hideki Tojo. And it is a year before Operation Barbarossa as well. So Japan is getting in there long before there's a war with... with um, 
with uh, between the Soviet Union and the uh, and the fascist powers, who knows that might actually lead to the Soviet Union joining the other side. That might lead to um, Hitler and Mussolini trying to get. It might do. I, I doubt it, and I haven't put it in the scenario so far, as I doubt that at any point Stalin would actually do a military alliance alongside Hitler. Um, there were agreements, but I think he was only prepared to go so far. I don't think he wanted to get involved in an actual war. In which case, the scenario could have been Russian troops trying to invade Alaska. Um... That could have been interesting. Americans and Canadian forces fighting in Alaska against Soviets. Yeah, that's we're not going to that scenario. Does this mean Nigeria? Well, remember, America doesn't join the war historically till December 1941. Okay, so... Japan's joining the war, and again, it's kind of like World War One. Japan's joined the war, America hasn't. I think, I do think if any Japanese forces are deployed to North Africa, etc., they're going to have to go through a program of upgrades and developments, etc. But I think they could do that. And also, it's going to free up all the troops historically in Burma, etc., for operations. So, yeah. It's interesting. IJN escorts deal. Uh, well, potentially the IGN supports dealing with the Italian Red Sea ports, but um, the British are already dealing with that to an extent. But it's mainly the fact the British uh, have to hold off forces to balance the uh, Japanese while they're dealing with that. That's why the Canadian Brigade goes to Hong Kong, etc. If they don't have to do that, then those forces are free to deal with the Italians. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Joseph Stalin stays out myself. As long as they don't invade him, invade him. But there again, this is Hitler we're talking about. So Hitler's never exactly um, been consistently awarded the Strategic Genius Award. I don't think the army's going to necessarily get into the war as quickly as the navy. I can see the Navy getting in more quickly. So now let's start working through the reactions. And also, come on. That is a good picture of Churchill, isn't it? I also think that's a good picture of him in 1940. The British Lion projecting it around the world. And one thing I would like to point out. Definitely not slimline trousers. Wouldn't be caught dead in slim fit trousers is Winston Churchill. So, what is Churchill going to do? What do we think Churchill does? This is the interesting question. What do we think Churchill's reaction is going to be? You know, I, I, I'm putting out to the chat to start off before I get in there, but what do you think Churchill's reaction is going to be? Churchill does a jig. German Square for joys. Um, yeah, let's see, if, let's see if a few more responses come through, what they're going to be. Celebrate. Gordon Bennett. Yeah. Uh, honestly, a long, wonderful welcome aboard. I wonder if Japanese would be better behaved towards prisoners of war or civilians if they were fighting alongside the UK and other allies. Well, that was the entire British idea about um, why to fight alongside them at the, uh, the siege of um, uh, siege of Tsushima. 
Uh, no, the Siege of um, Singtao. Fisher, 1906. In, in, in IGN Metal Fleet. Don't take this the wrong way, Fisher, but y you're jumping well ahead and no. Um, no, uh, th there are lots of ships which aren't available. You see, the thing is, they have all sorts of ships, but they have to still honour their own commitments. And some of those ships which they do have are in major refits and upgrades. So, yeah, there's not a lot of those available. And also, they don't necessarily need... Uh, do you really want to take some of those vessels into into the Mediterranean? That's the going to be a question. So it's going to be a whole discussion. Uh, he drink the switch is got uh, for, for sake? Potentially. Uh, sure, Given what he said about working with the Russians, probably rather positive. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think he can run on. Don't think he cancels the capital ship program out of reflex. Uh, at this point, the King George V's are getting finished off, and Vanguard is. Anything else? We'll leave you on side. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. Um, a, Bri a big speech about a British lion and Japanese dragon. Um, well, China's more the dragon. The, J the Japanese, the dragonfly more, and various other things. Um, it, it's more interesting to talk, to talk about the Japanese as an animal. He'll probably come to some... Hello, what is going on, uh, uh, shipping? Hello, Sal. How are you doing? No, no, no. This is an alternate history. We're getting into the fun parts. Pretty much, the first thing Churchill's reaction is going to be is, yes, we've got the Japanese, and then how can we use the Japanese? What can we use? What's available? What are they prepared to give us? You see, the thing is, Fisher just put up an entire... Fisher 1906 in the chat just put up an entire IGN med fleet where they sent all the ships to the Mediterranean. That doesn't help the British, and they can't facilitate for all those ships in the Mediterranean. Remember, they have, sitting in Alexandra in their harbours, quite a large, significant section of the French fleet already. They only have a space for certain, uh, so many ships. Also, they really don't need that many in the Mediterranean. They do need far ships for the Atlantic fleet. So what I think happens is an honest conversation. And I think the British will be looking at going, well, we need some ships to support the Atlantic fleet, to, make our, to support the King George V, to support Renown, Repulse, and Hood, etc. So... What you might see is Force H in Gibraltar get some Japanese ships assigned to, assigned to assist with them and a combined force set up. You might well find some some Japanese vessels being sent and asked to go to Scarpa Flow and operate from there. I think you will get some vessels sent to the Mediterranean, but how quickly they're going to turn up in the Mediterranean. And immediately, the only vessels available really are four Congos. Nagatos, remember, and quite a lot of other their other ships are still having to go, sp traditionally spend all of 1940 and a large chunk of 1941 being upgraded with the Gaussing, extra armor, all sorts of things to get them ready for war in 1941. This is starting war in 1940, halfway through. So it's going to be, have to be a full analysis. He's also going to be worried about the American reaction because American-Japanese relations are not good. So he's going to have to think about how he's going to manage that and how he's going to manage that integration and what's going to happen. He's also going to think about how he's going to play this with the Americans because if he plays it right, it could lead to the Americans getting involved. Think about that one for fun. It could lead to the Americans getting involved. He also has to manage his Commonwealth allies. He has to manage everything that's going on with them. Because some of them are going to be less happy than others. Remember the big problems that have happened between Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Canada very much vetoed increased Commonwealth for, uh, Dominion defence spending in the 1920s and 30s, despite Australia and New Zealand wanting it, because Australia and New Zealand were worried about Japan, but Canada was worried about upsetting America. They felt if you did spend more on defence, that would upset America. Australia and New Zealand were worried about Japan attacking them, so they wanted to spend more on defence. So he's got to, uh, to, got to manage a lot of complicated relationships, and that's going to be a factor in this.
As Sal has just pointed out, in World War One, the Admiral Mayor of the United States they wanted to get the four Congos to the US East Coast to cover a potential German battlecruiser breakout in the Atlantic. Yeah. The, Ge the Americans were worried about them. Force J and Alexandra? Potentially. Michael Cooch, so Congos plus one carrier to Atlantic? Potentially. I'll be talking about this as we get on, but it's a, it's a thing to think about. Could the Black Band Skewer dive bomb site be refitted to the Aki D3A? Mm, that's an interesting idea. Colin I can see him having words with a visiting ambassador to a neutral power, matching support for Japan invading French Indochina if they don't play nice. Oh, I could see him having all sorts of interesting conversations with the Vichy. Um... Nice to get this one will not be ready until 1941. Yeah, we're getting into that. Don't worry, we're getting into this. Foreign officers are going to be burning... Yes. In this scenario, Bryn's going to be happy, but they're now going to have to go into management mode. They're going to have to manage all this. So, it's... I don't know why my nose is now suddenly itching. It's usually your ears itching when someone's talking about you. So, what does it mean when your nose is itching? Oh, well, leave it on one side. Um, Code eight five. If Churchill plays it wrong, the Americans will still get involved in not a good way. Well, that's the thing. If he plays it wrong, the Americans might decide they don't want to get involved or might dis add things to British trouble. But there again, think about it this from this perspective. The traditional thing of America is they're the arsenal of democracy, etc. In this scenario, Britain now has access to Japanese factories and to procure from the Japanese. All the Japanese need is access to raw materials. And what does the British Empire have lots of? Lots of raw materials. So, you know, for America, it's also got them in a bit of a catch-22. From quickly, how did you say? How do you say where did all these frigating torpedoes come from? Italian jump. We're going to be getting to that. And Raji, why do I imagine a scenario where some gung ho American politician basically goes, "Well, we need to be involved in the war so the Japanese don't upset us." Well, here is the problem. Because remember, again, I've always told you the strategic calculation that came with war with Japan. If either Britain or America found themselves at war with Japan, the other had to join the war because for fear that the, uh, the, the one who was at war would win the war and then would overwrite their position in the Far East as well. So now America could be... Uh, America, Japan's joined this war on the side of Britain. America's got a real problem on its hands because if it doesn't join the war, what's it just mean? Britain and America, Britain and Japan will cement their alliance in blood, and then if there's an incident between the Japanese and the Americans, the Brits might take the American, might take the Japanese side, and then that's a problem for America because taking on the British Empire and Japan, okay, they can they can possibly win that. They've got a chance. But it's going to be a far, far more dangerous fight than just fighting Japan. And that's got to be some strategic analysis of going through here. Would Churchill offer US Iceland? I think he already offered the US... I think there was already um, various interesting things... Um, In, in in regards to Iceland, Iceland's occupied by the British first, and then it's occupied by the Canadians, and then the Americans take it over in June 1941. Again, before war begins, the Americans uh, before the Americans join the war, they're occupying Iceland. So um, that's the thing. At this point, I think you're into the, almost the Canadian occupation of Iceland. This is going to be an interesting scenario, and again, we've got more slides to go through. We've got a slide actually on America's reaction. So before we get into this too much, we're going to do the, this sort of working through. It will, as Fisher 1906 be a, both a huge relief and a headache to the UK at the same time. It'll be amazing, and it'll be a, oh, frigate, we now have to organise this. Uh, Cunningham slowly 
I no, he wouldn't be stroking his hands. He'd be playing golf with glee at the idea of extra eight inch and six inch cruisers he'd be getting his hands on. Um <laughs> That's no, Mitchell. The IGN will not be able to send all the ship. It needs to protect its own merchant fleet. But, yeah, but the thing is, uh, imagine being a surface raider in the Indian Ocean or the uh, Indian Ocean if you're being hunted by both British and other Chi Japanese forces out there. That's going to change things. Now, if we think about it, HMS Sydney was lost in November 1941. Imagine if HMS Sydney had, I don't know, been backed up by a Japanese cruiser. Let's say... Which one shall I pick on? It's so tempting to pick on something small, but... Uh, Let's go for uh, uh, let's let's go for they've been if they imagine if they've been backed up by Yubari or Sendai class or a Sendai class vessel, and let's say you know HMS Sydney has a Sendai class cruiser with her, that's going to change that situation entirely. Thomas, itchy nose means someone visited you. Hopefully bring some eyebrow. Oh, we can always hope that one. Go on, so does your shipyard's finance? Well, we're going to see. We're going to get through this. William Williams, Sydney has attained a raid from British. Um, they don't... At Let's put it this way. There is a fusion of British and American radar research. And the Americans certainly get a leg up, but they have already been doing their own radar research and have some very good ideas themselves. So there is some stuff going on. But also, remember, Japan's probably going to get a leg up as well. Britain's going to decide exactly how much information and technologies they're going to share with Japan. And it's probably going to be similar to the level they they have share with America as well. So there's, it's probably going to be a parity, which is going to be a very interesting thing because Japan's now going to have time to build up the resources and build up the infrastructure and build up those systems. You know, the, one of the traditional issues for the Japanese was their limitations in terms of infrastructure, especially research infrastructure, of their population size and the, uh, the various natures of Japan. So with access to the British research and the British development and British technologies, Things could change very quickly. Allies' reaction. I'm going to pick on two. John Curtin and Peter Fraser. Uh, for Curtin and Fraser, Japan was the existential threat. It was the reason they had to hold back forces. And they were worried about things being committed into North Africa and the Mediterranean and not being around Australia. And they were worried about the various scenarios going on. This changes that. Suddenly Japan is an ally. Yes, they're still probably not going to be happy. They're still not going to trust them. They're still not, it's still not going to be, yes, uh, we, 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 we support you in 100%. But it's going to change their strategic scenario as well. Because it's going to push a lot of Japanese forces past them towards the front line. So for them, it's going to represent a major... How do I put this? stabilization of the status quo. It's going to help them security wise. Traditionally both these countries end uh, end the Pacific end the Second World War looking to America as much as they do Britain because of for strategic security. With Japan suddenly announcing its alliance with Britain and saying it's joining the war on Britain's side, that firms up Japan America Britain as a very, very useful strategic partner and the Commonwealth and the whole Dominion scenario as a very strong thing. I can also see them turning it to their advantage as well. There are lots of advantages of a relationship with Japan and a good relationship with Japan. Japan, if 
they're going on to an industrial set, uh, setting, and if they're really focusing on producing weapons, etc., they're going to be short of food. Australia, New Zealand are both net exporters of food. And Japan will be a thriving market to supply. We often talk about Japan needing fuel in World War II and that driving a lot of her actions. She also often needs food. So, there are going to be some differences though. There are going to be some differences. I can imagine Canada is going to be disquieted by this news because that might upset America. And Canada's number one priority, despite being a British Dominion, is always we don't want another war with the Americans. Mainly because this is one of the interesting things about some of the Canadian strategic do doctrine. Or they're not worried they're going to lose the war. America's going to end up taking them over. They're worried about the devastation it's going to cause and the damage it's going to cause while it's being fought. Li that That's literally their focus. They, they do... The Canadians have great faith in their ability to hold on to Canada in the face of the Americans. And there again, though, if you consider the Can the American army for most of the 1920s and 30s and the actual logistics and the state of its training, you can understand why. Because as good as the American army, as in their soldiers are, everything behind them is terrible. Now... The interesting thing is this could have an impact on Japan back because, let's be honest, integration into this scenario, Yonai is going to use it as a way to strengthen his position as Prime Minister and to strengthen, uh, strengthen his regime. And he's going to do his best to integrate Japan into this alliance as a way to show them there is a better way for getting honour and security. And the thing is, this could well change the Japanese position. Because remember, the Japanese often feel second sign of Japanese war, etc. All these things, they're being forced into a corner by the Americans. Yes, their own actions are leading to the American actions, which is forcing them into a corner. But they feel they're being forced into a corner. And so that has an impact on their strategic thinking. In this scenario, they're no longer being forced into a corner. They have lots of open avenues. And they have lots of chances of glory. And they have allies. And they could well feel they have secure fuel, secure food, as long as they're part of this alliance. Now, we're going to get to America in a... In, I think America is the next slide, so you don't have to worry, we're going to be covering that. But the realistic point is, again... Without them, without them being bombed, Japan has a lot of infrastructure that can grow, and Australia and New Zealand have a lot of infrastructure that could grow in this period. This is the other scenario. We often talk about a Bob Semple tank. Well, imagine if the Australians had had longer to produce it. Had had longer to develop their infrastructure in the street so they could produce a better tank. This is the thing. What you're really giving all these nations is time. They are involved in a war, they're getting all the information and data from a war, but they are a long way from the war. They're not panicking, they're not rushing. They have time. The American reaction. Okay, well, starters, you have the fact that without a second Sino-Japanese war, some of the overt anti-Japanese feeling is probably not there. There are going to be complications, though. One of the things is, are some people going to say, well, if Japan's part of it, um, and, you know, uh, they didn't want to hand... We didn't want to help Britain in the first place, a section of the US political... A group wanted uh, would say, we don't have to do. We can, don't need to now get part of it. But the thing is, there's now going to be a new faction involved as well. There's going to be the faction who perceive war with Japan as inevitable. Going, do we want to end up in a war with Japan where Britain owes them, and they don't owe us? 
do we want to be in a scenario where the British Empire is even in a is even pro neutral or rather a beneficent neutral to Japan in that kind of war scenario? Do we want to end up in a scenario where Japan gains territories? Maybe at expense of the Vichy French and the Italians. Who knows? And we have to take them on. Do we want to be in a scenario... Japan's technology is going to accelerate with this kind of war fighting. They're going to be allowed access to British technology on levels which we aren't get. They're going to get stats. They're going to get information. They're going to get developed in ways we aren't pushing for. Honestly, I can see it going one of three ways. One, the least likely, I think, is the Americans cut off support for the Allies and don't get involved at all. I, I don't see that happening. One, they're earning too much money for it. And two, the realistic realism is they're using it to build their own forces and they do not trust the Germans and they expect them to come after them eventually next. So I don't see one happening. Two, they try and make a DM and try and make it a standard by which their so their supplies and anything they give goes to the British and the British allies, but doesn't go to the Japanese at all, and try and split the alliance. But that would cause enough trouble that and would be enough, and I think the British would just ignore it. They would sign it and then tell the Japanese we're ignoring it. Here, have the kit. Um, enough that it would be an ongoing sore and a very big problem for the Americans to actually... And also the Americans realistically can't enforce that. Once something's in a war zone, it gets picked up by people. Um, Megascro, you're jumping into internment camps and all sorts of things. You are miles down the track. You are at the end of the video. You are a long way away. So I realize you have these questions, and they are very pressing questions to you, but right now, they are nothing to do with the section we're on, and we're not got to them yet. Because we haven't even got to the Japanese actually physically being involved. They've just said they're going to join, and we're discussing the reactions. And this all builds into that. So, I love the questions, I love the enthusiasm, but hold it for a few minutes. Well, probably about an hour, judging by the time I normally get through these things, okay? Um, and the third option is go Nazis must be stopped Nazis are bad guys we're going to join this world war against evil we will stand up for good for democracy there's also a faction in the Americans who actually do like you and I okay again please notice the Americans aren't, they are very, very stupid in their handling of diplomacy with Japan. I mean, if you can make any blundering mistake in diplomacy, the Americans make it. Every single racist, um, stereotypical trope you can fall into when dealing with Japanese people, they not only fall into, they, pl they charge into headfirst, shouting, this is going to make you like us, while actually simultaneously insulting them. They manage to do that almost every single time. The Japanese aren't necessarily better at communicating than the Americans either. It's quite fun sometimes to read the diplomatic cabal, uh, uh, relations. But even the Americans acknowledge that whilst Yonai is a prime minister... It's their best chance for a good, a, po a peaceful relationship, a positive relationship with Japan. So. This is the reality. And I think probably what you have is the Americans... There are variations of the Americans joining the war and supporting the war, okay? There is committing ground forces. I'm not sure about that. I committing to an Operation Torch or something like that. I, I don't necessarily think that happens. But they might say we're going to commit naval forces to support the war. And that could be their moderate ground. We're going to send naval forces to support the war. Supplying the Allies is one thing, but that doesn't get them the same information as actually fighting with the Allies, alongside the Allies. 
and it doesn't get them a voice at a table when the war needs to be decided. Remember, the Americans know eventually the war is going to be decided by a negotiated settlement. Either that settlement is going to be the German and Italian surrender, or it's going to be the British and uh, Japanese leading a negotiation because the war, they just worn out of the war. If America hasn't actively participated in the war, they're not going to be at that table. So I think you get a level of... I think you get a level of realism. And I can see there being enough factions coalescing together that a naval war, i.e. just deploying naval forces, could be a viable thing. But it's not going to happen quickly. For example, I think if Japan joins in 1940, I don't see the Americans getting involved. If the Japanese join in June 1940, I don't see the Americans actually getting involved till 1941. I still don't see them doing that. I see it taking them a long time for them to work it out. Now, again, Congress and the public might support neutrality, but Congress is not silly enough to run them or shoot themselves completely in the foot. Boy, I must. Uh, so I think they're sort of getting. Do the British have some kind of historic review of Japanese and the US atomic? No, the British have a very. The British have a mixed view. There are certainly some who have similar derogatory view of Japanese as the US establishment. There really are. But there are also a lot of people who've worked with the Japanese over years. You have to remember the Japanese had a long alliance with Britain. And it, there had been a lot of interactions during World War One, a lot of working together in fleet operations in the Mediterranean and various other things. And there had been a lot of shipbuilding expeditions, a lot of aircraft building expeditions, the Semple expedition, etc. Which I know was... Uh, marred by espionage and all sorts of things, but there have been a lot of um, how do I put this politely? Interactions which have allowed them to have a more nuanced perspective on Japan. And their diplomacy has usually stressed the nuanced side. The officers deployed like, Nobel, uh, like Admiral Noble to the China station have often been through that. And Yes, there is. There are all sorts of scenarios which you know could change this even more. There's the fact that there is always a possibility that Hitler or Mussolini managed to bring America into the battle anyway. But at this point, I can see the Americans putting forward a policy that we have to get away. If the if the Japanese are announcing they're supporting the British. And that they're saying, especially if you and I stresses, it's the great power responsibility to support the other great powers when they are preserving good, uh, preserving the forces of good and status quo in the world. A sort of thing. It, it, it could well be said to be um, showing up America. You see, that's the thing. It depends how Yonai plays it, and it depends how Hitler plays it. But if it's because how Hitler and how Churchill play it, and you know all those three are going to be part of it. And also Roosevelt. But if it so becomes perceived that basically America hanging back is not living up to their status as a great nation, that's going to be the impact. Hi, Dave Harrison. Hello, MC Legend 13 2 And hello, Alfred B228902 B and RG. Hello, everyone. So. The thing is, it's going to be a complicated response. What the Americans do is going to be a very, very complicated response. Thank you, Jack Ray. Uh, they are. They are going to find themselves dealing with.
probably the need to try and balance the competing factions. I can see Roosevelt having to play a very skillful game. But again, it's the thing is if the, if both if Britain and America, Japan are both emphasizing it's their great power responsibility to stand up to evil dictators. And it's the monarchies standing up for democracy, i.e. the king of Britain and the emperor of Japan standing up for democracy, standing up for freedom against the dictatorships who would abuse their people. Then I can see Roosevelt having um, interesting conversations with some members of Congress going, you do realize we are getting embarrassed here. Yes, America has a strong strain of isolationism, but they also have a strong strain of exceptionalism. And the trouble is with your self-image of being an exceptional nation, you often believe, well, other nations have this, you have to then live up to that ideal. And if they think they might not be living up to that ideal, that could push them. And some of the South American nations probably do join in this scenario as well. You might find Chile joins especially. Um, their battleship could get involved. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you get other nations, other neutrals deciding to join in. It's, it's, it's going to be a, a, an interesting scenario, really, for the Americans especially. Because it's going to be quite political for them to navigate. Now, well, Hitler Mussolini, Charlie Chaplin, and fun boy, fat, uh, fun boy, fat boy, Mark Free, the new unimproved edition. Well, technically Mediterranean version, Mark II, a new and improved edition. But yeah, he's this is this is going to be a fun conversation for them. I honestly, those two look weird. But leaving that to one side, their reaction. Well, they spent a lot of time trying to chat up to Japan. For Germany, this means that pressure supply route, which opens up during the war, where Japanese submarines are dropping off key materials and other supplies in ports and... Remember, this is happening even before. Japan is a key trading partner through uh, uh, technically neutral France, etc. Even earlier than that. You cut off Japanese supply of materials, and that's something missing from German industry. There's also the fact that for Mussolini, this means Britain's going to get reinforcements in the Mediterranean. For both of them, they're going to realise Britain's going to get reinforcements. Uh, I, it becomes interesting in that, do, do they make a reaction to try and go for the French fleet? I'd almost be tempted to say they might actually try and push for different, me, uh, different things about the French fleet, to try and take the French fleet. Um, because... They are going to find it very difficult to look at the numbers. They really are. Now, I could see... Leslie Mitchell's brought this up, and I was saying this at the point. The pro-German parts of Japanese society could cause trouble. But here's the thing. If there's a statement from the Emperor released that he is glad to support his brother monarch, or something like that, on those lines, and it wouldn't be... Completely unusual, and you and I possibly could get the Emperor to agree to this. Something along the lines of, it's a sa it was a sacred alliance between the Emperor and the, ki the King, the uh, Kings of England, the Kings of Great Britain. Then I think you might find the pro-German sections of Japanese society will go, Ah, oh, frigate, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Germany no longer has a Kaiser. And this is to support a fellow monarch. Um, that could be an interesting scenario. And yes, the Boshin War was an interesting one. But in that scenario, the Boshin War... 
you always have to remember it was the British faction which won the Boshin War. No, it was a, a faction which was supported by the Brits. Um, there is a pro-German faction in Japan. That faction is... Um, how do I put this? Like a puddle. It covers a lot of area, but it's very, very shallow. And I have a feeling they deal uh, that would be dealt with by a uh, 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 various things. A royal wedding when well, Princess Elizabeth is a bit young at this point. I don't think that would work. Maybe Princess Margaret. <laughs> we'll not get into that, but uh, this is the scenario we're talking about. Really, it would be very much a. An alliance between the monarchies is how I would, uh, how I could see, especially Yonai. I think that's how he would stress it because how he works and how he deals with Japanese society a lot is by presenting himself as the minister of the emperor. He is also presented by the emperor as the minister of the emperor. He is, it's like, it's a, he is singled out for many special awards and rewards from the Emperor for his loyalty and honour, because he's considered such a good and honourable man. And remember, he is, again, I'm not saying he's perfect, please note, I did do a whole video about him, I know his faults. But, in this scenario, I think he'd be stressing, and that's one of the reasons why people don't attack him, because... There is a whole different section between if we assassinate him, we know he's close with the Emperor. We know he's one of the Emperor's people, and that's a whole thing in Japanese society, especially strong in this period. So, the Japanese, you know, it, it, it's a case of, I think, that with that and stressing of that, I don't think the pro-German faction is going to be necessarily part of it. Now... On the scenario of Merzel Kabir, etc., this does prevent th present things as an interesting scenario for the Vichy French. Um, it also presents more complications for the British. Because you probably still have Merzel Kabir, because I don't see the French changing their admiral in charge of Merzel Kabir. So, Leon uh, Lernor Eldarin, yeah, it, it would be interesting. I think it could change things in terms of Alexandria Harbour. But I don't think they'd be fighting because Cunningham still manages it. Italy declared war on the 10th of June. So Italy have 15 days later found themselves fighting the Japanese as well. Yeah, they're, they're not necessarily happy with this scenario. Like most of us, Italy could see a way out for the monarch in such a scenario when things really start going bad. Yes, that is the, the, that is a scenario open to the Italians. It really is. But honestly, I think at this point, Mussolini still thinks he has a chance of winning. But... France really falls on the 25th of June. So basically, France falling is when the Japanese decide to announce that they're coming to Britain's aid. So whilst Merz el Kabir doesn't happen for a few days, it's not going to involve any Japanese. And I, I didn't put any, because honestly, I thought... What forces could Japan get out there by the 3rd of July? You're talking nine days. What's going to get from Japan and where Japan has their fleets to help Somerville and Merzel Kabir? No. So there's going to be no Japanese impact on that scenario. Um, Colin Cameron, so would you see some of the royals in the Navy being sent to Japanese postings to help integrate the IJN CNC with the Royal Navy? No. They didn't do it in World War One. they were not going to do it now. 
you, you don't need to do that level. We're talking about at the strategic higher level using the royal connection as the reasoning and the way of working out. It's not going to be needed at that level. Um, although, let's be honest, where is Prince Philip? Mediterranean fleet, you know, these sort of things. There are enough wandering around that if a local admiral feels he needs someone to do these sort of things, he can find one. I don't see the Vichy making a side deal. I know, that was my that was my point, but, uh, point, but also a good point about Alex that Danton is still leading. Uh, uh, I too. Yeah, that I think the Germans might try. As said, I I do think one of the scenarios is the Germans do try and seize the fleet. But there's actually less in Toulon at this point than there will be later when they do originally go for it, and that might actually cause more trouble because when you're talking about the twenty fifth of twenty fifth uh, June, if the French, if the Germans, re uh, Germans and Italians react to the Japanese announcement by trying to drive for the fleet, that means they break the treaty immediately and so if they break the treaty straight off they could find themselves the the vichy french government might fall the french forces might tr carry on trying to resist all sorts of things happen in fact they could turn france into an absolute quagmire so honestly it prevents a nightmare scenario for the germans if they and the germans and italians if they drive on the french if they drive on the french fleet the best they can probably hope is that the French fleet sinks itself, but it could actually. It's probably not been destored yet. They could make out to coast. They could go out to sea and join the British. So, any scenario where they decide to go for the French fleet is not going to be a good scenario. They're going to lose. They're not in position to do the drive on it. They're not in a position to achieve to get to that fleet. But, they've just had Japan enter the war. So that fleet represents their best hope. So no, no, Prince Philip isn't part of the royal family. Yet. He is. Okay? He's connected through the Mountbatten's who are connected to the royal family. You're thinking of royal family as just the core royals. You need to think about the royal family in terms of Brit in terms of extended family terms, in terms of British uh, the British terms at this point, and extended family terms, and the Japanese in extended terms. So, yes, they are a part of the royal family. Uh, yes, the Mountbatten's are an off-branch, thanks to them having been the Battenbergs, which Prince Louis, uh, who I'd spent the last week talking about, who was, of course, part of the royal family. And that was what caused some of the issues, as you'll see on Saturday, with the various MPs tending to pick on his German ancestry. So... Yeah, he's not part, but he is part of the royal family, if that makes sense. So, this is actually, honestly, the hardest point. I, on whether or not they go for the French fleet... My strong suspicion is Hitler decides to try and keep his word because he does historically. And he thinks he, he thinks he'll get peace of Britain soon anyway. So he goes for that. And Mussolini's forces can't drive on Toulon alone. So I don't think they do drive on the French fleet. Which I think leads to Mayor's El Kabir happening as it did historically. Hello, Wayne Niles. And Juicy Suji. I don't know if I said hello, but hello. And did I say hello, hello Lernar? If I didn't, hello. And Raptor up. So, um, basically, I think... I think that happens as it does historically. But I think both the powers are going to be reacting with slight trepidation. If they're thinking, their governments, their, their, their governments are going to be thinking. The Italian Navy, the Rage of Marina, is going to be looking at the Royal Navy and thinking, oh, frigate, they're going to get reinforcements. And if Hitler is being sensible, he's going to start thinking through his next actions. Uh, but he's probably just concentrating on, well, let's do air attacks on Britain. Let's uh, listening to Goering and going, yeah, we can bomb Britain in submission and then Japan will have to fall out of the war as well. So that's his scenario. He's probably just pushing on with that and really emphasizing that campaign. 
Which could be interesting because... Let's be honest. We always think about the zero. But... It's not just the zero which is in the Japanese arsenal. It really isn't. And in World War II, they have some interesting aircraft. And they have some really interesting aircraft. I'm specifically thinking, in this period, of the um, uh, Hayabusa. Because that, the Oscar, as the ally calls it, would be a very interesting aircraft if it turned in the UK, up in the UK for air defense duties. It'd be a very interesting aircraft. And there are a few others of the Japanese, which if they got access to British engine technology could be... And if, the, if you managed to fuse some of the British and the Japanese engine technology, you could produce some really interesting aircraft. But let's be honest, the Ki-43 Hayabusa, that's a 330 mile per hour or 290 knot aircraft um, with a range of 950 nautical miles. Yes, you probably want to upgrade the guns. But that thing could be interesting. Emily and Mavis for ASW author. There's all sorts of interesting things which can come about it here. You could also get Japanese the Japanese sending pilots to the UK who then fly Spitfires. Because it's easier to transfer personnel than it is to transfer aircraft. So the Japanese could send a whole load of pilots to the UK to help reinforce and fight the battle to help the Battle of Britain. And again, the thing is for the Americans, yet traditionally they supply the Eagle Squadron. If there's a Japanese co uh, comparison, imagine those two groups fighting to see who's going to get the most air-to-air -air kills. And that's if the Americans don't actually join the uh, join the uh, join the Allies in the scenario. So, what is actually likely to happen next? Now. The first thing I thought was, well, it's going to be ships which turn up first. They're going to bring some cruisers and they're going to bring some destroyers as escorts, but it's going to be the ships that matter. So let's go through what was actually operational. Does anyone in chat want to take the Ryujo anywhere near the North Atlantic? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Anyone here want to take the Ryujo into the North Atlantic? I'm waiting. I'm going to give you a chance. Anyone want to take the Ryujo into the North Atlantic? <laughs> so, I think we can all... No, no, it's going to... No. <laughs> Lots of no's coming into the chat. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nights, he said, everyone, that's strong. What the hell the other side of the weather? No. <laughs> I guess that's experiment. Uh, no. So, no, I don't think anyone's sending the nut a it. So, no. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord. The chat is conclusively going no. So, I'm leaving Ryojo in the Pacific. Like, 
The Americans, even in peacetime, left certain carriers in the Atlantic while they were strengthening the... Pardon me, the Pacific Fleet. Oh, I've got hiccups. You're laughing while trying to drink iron brew. This is not good. Now... Um... Well, Karga is currently in being modernised. So Karga is not available to November 1940. She comes out in modernisation in November 1940, and then it's going to be at least a... Sorry. Another nine months or so, six or nine months working up. So initial operations of what's available, Karga's not there. And if I want to go into Mediterranean, I would prefer to have an uh, have an armored deck, but I'd also prefer to have a worked up ship. So honestly, I think it's going to be what's going to be deployed is a Kagi. To the, <coughs> sorry, excuse me a second. Where are all the burps coming from? Um, in question of, no, I haven't uh, covered the Soviet Union yet, Lucas Junch, because I'm going to get to them in a second. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully that helps the uh, <clears throat> hiccups. Now, I can see Soryu being sent to the Mediterranean. I have a reason for this. Hiryu is working up in 1940, only just been commissioned in 1939. It really isn't available to go. Soryu is the latest carrier, it's the most modern carrier, it's the one which is the most survivable. And it's the one which is best for going to Mediterranean. It gives it will probably go along with Illustrious, will probably be there will be there, and Eagle will be there. So you're talking about a third carrier. So there's a scenario for that. In terms of capital ships which are available, you have Congo, Heiei, Krishima, and Haruna. They've all been modernized, and whilst Heiei is still working up. And literally, she's only come out of reconstruction in January 1940. I could see Congo, he uh, Krishima, and Haruna being sent to support the British fast fleet, the Atlantic fleet. I could see one of those ending up with Renown, or Hood, I think it's Renown at this point, with Force uh, with Force H, supporting Ark Royal. And I could see the other two... Um, Congo and Krishima probably, because I reckon Haruna ends up with the Force H. I have a feeling of that one. Um, Krishima going to Scarpa Flow and being part of the Force there to deal with any German outbreaks by their fast capital ships. Now, when it comes to Nagato Mutsu, well, this is going to be an interesting one. Where do they end up? Traditionally, they need a lot of work before they can be sent to war. But... There are options for them. They are not the fastest battleships in the world, let's be honest. But they're not slow either. They're capable of 26 and a half knots. I think they'd find themselves sent to the Mediterranean fleet, but they need to be modernized first. So I don't think they're going to turn up in the Mediterranean for at least six months. I don't think you see them in the Mediterranean until at least 1941. And I think they would probably arrive about the same time you'd have some soldiers start to arrive. I think you would probably get first would be deployment of the, the quickest, the first likely deployment of the Japanese would be some pilots from the IJA to support the Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain. I have a feeling they would deploy pilots first rather than aircraft because that's the sensible thing to do. And then maybe their aircraft come across. But I think they probably send their pilots and they start flying British aircraft. Because the British have the logistics and the infrastructure to support those aircraft in the UK. What they have is a shortage of pilots. 
And so Japanese pilots showing up would help out. I do think the Nagato and Mutsu head up in the Mediterranean, but I don't think they end up in the Mediterranean until about 1941. And I think Ryujo, if it is used anywhere, it's going into the Metro, it's going into, into the Indian Ocean. Hiryu, um, again, I don't see her being available much before 1941. And I wouldn't be surprised if she ends up going to the Atlantic Fleet. It's going to depend on what, where they've suffered losses. Now, the interesting thing is going to be... Do you send seaplane cruisers to the Mediterranean? I don't think you do. The reason I don't think you do is, honestly, in the Mediterranean, with the air power you're dealing with, the ever-present land air, air threat, you've got no chance of launching and recovering those seaplane those seaplanes. So they're not really a useful thing. But they might be useful for the Atlantic, especially for things like operations in the South Atlantic and in the ocean in surface raid hunting. So I would say Tona and Chikuma, like Ron Rupak has just said, will be doing... Maybe, maybe not convoy protection work, but probably do be acting as hubs and hunting surface raiders. And I could see the Japanese doing a lot of hunting for surface raiders. Black Maxis, without the resource and manpower strengths, could Japan speed up the build time and commissioning time for their ships? No. They're building them as fast as they can. Remember, these are times pre-war. You're not in war till 1941 when they start the war. They are building them as fast as they can as it is. There is no getting this going any faster than it actually is. They're putting all the resources they can. Now... I see this, therefore, starting out as very much a naval deplo a naval war. But that's good. Uh, that's a good thing. That is a good thing for Yonai because if Yonai can, how do I put this politely? If Yonai can keep it naval. For a bit and get some victories, then he has strength. He has security. He also has the chance to win some victories, which can help him deal with some of his um, IJA problems. It's always useful. Why is that reset? Oh. <sighs> now, I can see the Japanese throwing themselves in quite fully into this war, but. I think, as said, the quickest to turn up is going to be aircraft. Is going to be ships. Then it's going to be air crew, which are going to go to Britain, and then it's going to be probably the aircraft themselves. I can see getting delivered to North Africa. So what is interesting is you could start seeing Japanese aircraft taking to the uh, taking to the field in North Africa. That would be, I expect to see them appearing there far earlier than they do in any European theatre. So Japan also has a seaplane tender and was always in company with the Georgia Savrov. Could well do. And the British will probably agree to send him fuel from the Middle East. He will probably be getting his fuel supplies from the British in the Middle East. But remember, again, without the second sign of Japanese war, he hasn't faced the same, full levels of sanctions from the Americans because what they justified with their sort of sanctions? What can justify any sanctions? If they're not doing their stuff in China.
This is Akagi and Kaga at Alexandra. No, but they wouldn't want Akagi in, in Alexandra Juicy Sushi. They just, that's not a ship you want to take that. And Kaga is not available. Uh, Kaga is in modernization. She doesn't come out till... If we go back to the beginning... Uh, November 19... Let's see. Akagi, uh, uh, Kaga, refit... Uh, Kaga, never refit till November 1940. So Kaga is not available. Hence, we're going with Soryu. As I've said before, the trouble with a lot of our perceptions and a lot of our views of World War II is that it's post -Dece post December 1941 timeline when certain ships are available. There is the fact that the Kido Butai doesn't really exist before 1941 because the ships don't exist. Now, the, I don't see the Japanese getting involved in the occupation of Iran because, or rather Persia, uh, I don't see them getting involved in that because, again, the British don't need them there. You're, you're moving forces in where you don't need to move them and you're also adding in complications. The British, it's bad enough, the British, the British are going to share that occupation again with the Soviets. So that's a whole scenario which you don't want to get the Japanese involved in because the Anglo the Japanese Soviet relationship is not great. And the Japanese do have tanks. Again, one of the perceptions of World War II that often comes up is that Japan didn't have any tanks. They did have tanks. They just were mostly kept on the home islands for the entirety of World War II. Uh, the vast majority of them, especially their very good their best ones. So you never see, they never really have an opportunity to deploy them. The interesting thing in this scenario is maybe they deploy some to North Africa to test them out. Coming on, would the Japanese pilots transit to UK via Canada? I don't see them doing that, mainly because it's probably easier to put them in a boat, in a ship, and take them round, uh, take them round Africa and oh, up to up the up the Atlantic to the UK, so they just literally go in a ship and turn up in the UK. Uh, if you take the, if you think about that, if you take them across the North Atlantic, take them across the Pacific to Canada, load them on a the train, you have to disembark them, load them on a the train, and then reembark them, and all those things. And the trouble is, whilst that might sound quicker. Imagine those pilots are going to be stopped for a dinner in every town to celebrate their arrival and welcome them as first. It's going to be great politics to send a group that way. It might not be great timing. HMS Verdun, we've already started discussing this earlier on the fact that the USA get involved to limit Japanese alliance. Uh, the Japanese influence. That was one of the things I did point out and discuss with those things. And discussed it earlier in the video. Locations. The narrative of a pro-democratic great power alliance could turn against communism after they are finished with fascism. It could do. And yeah, there are there are no trade routes for them to be of. Don't worry, Verdun. It was a little bit. It was a. It was literally two slides ago. So that's quite a few, uh, quite a while back. But you know, I'm just saying. I've, the reason I'm not answering the question is I've already covered that. I don't want to go over it again. <sighs> Mainly because once I start going over that again, we get back into that whole discussion. And I want to move on to the next discussion because, well, because it follows and it doesn't repeat it for people. Marcus Rowe, first group goes the short way of all the fan first, second group goes, I'd say a small group goes the first way and the second, uh, the large group goes the um, long, a long direct way. Uh, 
I no, I, I Steve Clark. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but Yamato is twenty seven is a twenty seven knot ship. Bismarck is not a twenty seven knot ship. Bismarck is a thirty knot ship. Yamato is not going to get put with the fast battleships. You need to be 28 knots or higher to get with them. There are uses for Yamato, but she's not. If she doesn't even, again, I have to keep. I have to keep going back to the first slide to talk this through because timelines. So Yamato isn't commissioned till December 1941. So even the Battle of Denmark Straits. That happens in May 1941. So she's not, not only is she too slow for it, she's not even commissioned in time for it. And definitely not worked up in time for it, because she's not worked up really till 20, uh, till 1942. No, Yamato is a 27 knot ship. Twenty-seven knot ship, yeah. Yamato is a twenty-seven knot ship. Sorry, Black Marks, well, she's not a fast battleship. And I remember I did this when I was doing. I remember this when I did a video about her because I had. I basically apologized in the video. I said, "Sorry, that's the cutoff. The cutoff is twenty-eight knots. If you're below twenty-eight knots, you're not a fast battleship." And Nagata is only 26 and a half knots. Okay. Well, we have to move on quite a bit before we get on to that. But as said, I've already added a Congo to the uh, to Force H. That would be one of the likely things I think would happen. Um, as said earlier, my, my belief uh, is that... Um, Haruna probably ends up with Force H, and Ark Royal, and Renown, and that force. Um, Hei has just come out of Reconstruction, January 1940 is still working up. So I reckon it's Kongo and Kirishima end up with the force at Scarpa Flow. So that's going to add things as well. But that's, again, Bismarck is 1941. There's the whole Operation Berlin before then. Yeah, Wayne Niles, that's not alternate history, that's fan fiction. And if people want to write that, that's fine. But I was asked an alternate history question of what happens if the Japanese do this, so I stick to the alternate history. Which means it has to be logical within the time frame of the history. Not just something I'm doing for fun. So, uh, fine, go. I'd say Yamato probably ends up in the Mediterranean to play with the Italians, and now I'm hearing his laugh, <laughs> cunning of laughing with that monster play. With. Well, we we could consider um, the Battle of Matapan is an interesting battle that, of course, takes place in March 1941. The fact is, I don't think Nagata. I don't think any. I think N Nagato and Mutsu might get there. Nagato and Mutsu might get there. So you might have at the Battle of Cunningham. You might have a battle of uh, a battle of Madapan. You might have Barham, Val Valiant, War Sprite, Nagato, and Mutsu. Anyone want to think about what that force does to the Italians? No worries, John K. Um, this is the sort of this is the trouble. And yeah, there's a, it's it's 
I do like, I have to say, I do like fan fiction when they do write them. I want to just clarify that from early one. It's just when I'm do, uh, doing alternate history, I, I try and keep it closer to the history. Because, yeah, actual university colleagues look at these things and then critique me if, I do, if I've not, uh, not explained my historical points enough. And one of those people is, Hello, Prof Lambert, if you're watching this one. Yes, I do know that you now can use YouTube, and thank you for the critiques. <laughs> I'm keeping my alternate history strict to historical lines. Yes, I always do. Because you started watching them. So, why have I held the Soviet reaction till after the fleet's deployed? Well, because Stalin is Stalin, and I think, honestly, his first reaction will be, oh, I'll see what they do. And then once they deploy, that's going to be his issue. Because he's sort of in the same problem as we all discussed the Americans are in. If the Americans are not involved in the war, then they do not get a seat at the table when the war's over to decide how the world split up. For Stalin, this becomes a problem. He's just finished, not that long ago, 1939, finished the war with the Japanese. He's got a similar problem to the Americans here. If he joins the war, are his forces ready for it? But if he doesn't join the war, is he ready for that world? And also... Is he ready for a world where there's the Anglo-Japanese alliance? Remember, Britain's already the big bad. Let, he might end up fighting Germany and Italy, but Britain is still the big bad in the Soviet perspective of the world. They're the ones who've cramped Britain, America, uh, Ru <coughs> Soviet Union, Russia's style for years. And Japan, well, they're still... They might have won the war, but there's the Battle of Tsushima still to remember in the whole Russo-Japanese war. So there are issues there. There are issues. Do I think he declares war on Germany? Not straight away. But, again, it becomes even more interesting if America does join the war. Because if America joins the war against Germany and Italy, and now there's a grand alliance, he might well perceive that he better join the war on the side of that alliance... Because if he doesn't, that alliance might turn on him next. If they become an anti-dictator dictator alliance, pro, you know, the public, pro-freedom alliance. That is, that is a scenario which he doesn't like the idea of. Whereas if he joins the alliance, then maybe, maybe from the inside, he can make sure it doesn't turn into an anti-Russia alliance. But there's also the perspective that he might decide he wants to join Italy and Germany. Because he might see this as, as, as Japan seeking allies to fight round to the next round. And then if America joins that alliance then that's a major force he has to think about. That's the three big powers, the other three big powers in the world. In his perspective, yes, he, he, he's, beaten the, he's beaten the Japanese, but can he fight all three of them? So his honest issue is going to be he's going to watch. He's going to watch and see what happens. Is it my, my view's reaction? He's going to look at the Japanese deployment of forces. He's going to start rating their navy. But he's going to also think, now which side of here do I join? Do I stay out? Stay neutral? Do I join the Axis forces? Do I join the dictators? Because only with them alongside, maybe I have a chance of winning the war against these powers? Or do I join the Allies to beat them up? Paul Amos, just because John wants to join the Allies, the Allies have to work with him. Well, the thing is, uh, if you are announcing you're joining the Allies in their war and you send deputy uh, send people, you then have to. How would the Allies explain not working with him? That's the problem.
Uh, Lucas Strange, the great Anglo-Japanese-American Finnish could be uh, Sans Worst Nightmare. Yeah, it's 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 going to be. It's an issue, and yes, as as people point out, he's already split Poland. He's had the Winter War, War with Finland. Um, that alliance could already be taking a dim view of him. So it's interesting. Now, Wayne Niles, you've brought up the Kantai Kessen. Would the Japanese strategy of Great Sea Battle have an influence on tactics? Uh, not really. I haven't brought it because, you see, here's the thing. There, if there was a war going on in the Pacific and the, Bri uh, and the British were slotting into the Japanese forces, the Japanese would be dictating the war. But if the Japanese forces are slotting into the British, they will no doubt feed in their doctrine and lines, but they'll be slotting into the British command and the British structure's already in place. So they'll bring their forces, but they'll be part of the fleets together. And also, the British, you have to remember, the Japanese policy of Kantai Kesson, uh, it's sometimes people over-focus on just the one end. That's part of it. There's also the attrition battle. There's all sorts of doctrines which go into achieving the Kantai Kesson. And it's for fighting under great fleet. It's very much something for fighting the Americans or fighting the British. So you draw them in, you attrit their forces, and then once you've attritted them enough, you then fight a decisive battle. Near enough Japan, you have decisive capability of strength, decisive strength versus whatever strength they have remaining to achieve the decisive victory. It's the Battle of Tsushima. Okay, that's the doctrine. That's not what you're going to have. The, ja the Italians don't have a, have a large enough fleet for decisive battle doctrine because the Japanese fleet outmasses the Italian fleet. And as we all know, the Italian fleet outmasses the German fleet. So, yeah, it, it's, it's the, the, that kind of doctrine doesn't feel in. So it's going to be the attrition doctrine. Which is going to be a big part of it. Which means they're going to be feeding in submarines. They're going to be feeding on aircraft carriers. And they're probably going to be slotting into the, what the British are doing. Because the British are going to go, yeah, we're blockading Germany. It's the easiest way. It's worked on them. They're, they're, they're weak to it. And the Japanese are going to go, fine. And if the Japanese uh, the Germans come out, that's going to be a scenario. Uh, will this live colour smaller nations like Portugal, Finland? Not really. Because... Don't take this the wrong way, but they really don't have much of a part in all this at this point in this scenario. Because Portugal, what's their reaction going to be of Japan joining the war? Mm, well, as much as we support Britain and find ways to support Britain, we don't want to be invaded by Spain, so we're not going to do anything different. It doesn't change that factor. For Finland, as much as they might like it, uh, they end up allying with Germany because next door is looking mean at them again and frankly no one else can get to them. So the smaller powers, as much as I would love to go into them, they really, their views in this scenario don't have an impact on things. As I did say though earlier, the smaller powers which are relevant are Alex, uh, Australia which I covered, New Zealand which I covered, I did mention Chile as well, and Canada. Those are the ones which have the point. Yugoslavia again... This point, Greece, etc. Um, these are all interesting powers in interesting positions, but Japan's involvement isn't going to really affect them that much. It, it affecting the fall of Greece because Greece historically falls. In uh, I remember the exact date, it might affect the fall of Crete, but. Honestly, Greece doesn't traditionally fall till April 1941. So that it's sort of that's that's a long way down the road from this point, and I don't think the Greeks will be actually annoyed that the the Japanese have joined the war. Do the Allies give the Japanese decent air guns? The Japanese might well find themselves getting some interesting experience in the Mediterranean. That could affect their perception of their guns. Liberation Norway. That's a long way off if that's being discussed. Again, you are... I, I'm loving the enthusiasm, but you're bouncing a long way ahead. We're still back in 1940. The forces are just arriving. If... The, if let's put it this way. 
If they announce they're going to be doing it in June 1940, they're going to join. I do not see these forces arriving in the Mediterranean until at least July 1940. And it's the 25th of June 1940, so yeah. I'd say the end of July, maybe even the beginning of August, they'll arrive in the Mediterranean. By the time they've been stored, crewed, and sent out with the appropriate forces with them. I wouldn't be surprised if the forces of tra heading to Atlantic arrived there definitely August, maybe September 1940. So, it's not going to be a quick implementation. And, yeah, IGN aircraft development might well change, but it's going to be a post, probably, 1941 change. Uh, you know, that, that's the reality. Because it's going to take a while for both them to get involved and for the information to filter back. And for the British to share information with them. Remember, they're going to have to set up a lot of systems. They're going to have to set up joint command systems, systems for working together under combat, systems for sharing information. Those are going to take months to set up. It's not going to be an immediate thing. I, 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 the Germans, Balkan invasion, Yugoslavia's German invasion might not happen. Uh, I don't see that. Sorry, Carl. As much as you might like Hitler to actually start acting rationally sensible, he's probably going to consider that even more important because if he makes a land grab and goes to those territory, that's going to strengthen him in terms of fighting this war against his great power. So I wouldn't be surprised if he goes into it even greater. And as said, Sean, and I've discussed this already, I don't see the Japanese ground forces turning up to at least 1941. And do they get chucked straight into Greece? Are they going to be ready to be chucked straight into Greece? They're going to take time to work up. I could see them actually being positioned in North Africa and being trained up and being used to justify sending the troops to Greece. Because you're not actually reducing the forces, you're replacing the forces of, of O'Connell, the, the British forces, which are worked up, with new Japanese troops to allow him to keep going, whilst his troops are sent off to, sent off to Greece. Which might well change the results, because it means O'Connell doesn't have the shortages, He but those troops aren't going to be the same or as well integrated as his own British troops have been. And John South, it's impossible to say how the French colonies react because it's going to depend on the colonial leaderships involved. And each one is an individual. So I can't just go through a list and go, this one now goes to the Vichy, uh, to the Free French and this one stays with the Vichy French because it's going to depend how they react to news, how they get the news, when they get the news and what their personal views on the subject are. Honestly, the Asian ones might well decide they have to go... Uh, they have to go free French, i.e. Indochina, etc., because otherwise they could face invasion. That and I could see happening very quickly. But it takes a while for the free French to be established as a force for them to even go free French. Like Marcus, you've now jumped several things. Not only have you got... You, you've jumped to northern Indian troops fighting Greek mountains. No idea. Again, this is strict to the strict, of, uh, strict rules of all time history. Things I can logically show... Yes, it would be sensible for the Indian, northern Indian troops from the mountain regions to be called to fight in, uh, fight in Greece. Will anyone think of it in time to actually get them there? Who knows? Probably not. Let's be honest. That would take a lot of force at a time and, and a lot of organisation, having ships in the right place and being able to move, the, move, uh, move those troops from there. And also, you don't know, again, the Sov if the Soviet action is aggressive and it looks like the Soviets might join the Axis forces, you might want to keep those troops in India to defend India in case of the Russians try come down through Afghanistan. So, you've got a lot of different things moving along. Honestly, Verdun, you are missing a lot of things, but we're going to start off with the Mediterranean. Because you've jumped into the Africa Corps landing, and, well, you've missed something. Because whilst the Africa Corps do land in June 1941, well, technically February 1941, they start getting down, that is a, that is a whole way down the track from where we are. We are 
probably the Japanese turning up with Soryu. As said, roughly, I would expect, late July, early August um, 1940. And the reason is... Well, then she's going to take a while to integrate. But one of the things you will see immediately happening, if she's there, you have a second carry. Now, if I want to do integration operations, I'd take her along in operations. I'd take her along with Illustrious and have Eagle maintained. So you now have that third carrier. Remember the what the British lost when they lost Korea, when they lost Glorious. They lost the third carrier that would have been in the Mediterranean. And so the third carrier comes in. You can now take Eagle out for maintenance. You don't have to keep pushing her and pushing her because she's the only other carrier you've got. You can bring along Soryu. And you can work up Soryu's fighters for air defense. You can work up her operating with HMS Illustrious in terms of carry integrations. So they can start working together. I think that's going to happen a long time before you start getting raiders and all the other fancy things we're all interested in. I know those are all the cool, sexy stuff, but honestly, you can't deploy the cool, sexy stuff until you've got the basics worked out of how your forces actually work together. You can't deploy raiders until you know actually you've got the coordination set up so those raiders, when they're coming back, don't get sunk by, an by a patrolling destroyer because they don't flash the right signal. So, all the things that are going to be coming about start with this. And these become the cornerstone of the fleet. As said, I don't think... The Japanese have a capital ship turn up in the Mediterranean immediately. A, it's not needed. The fast capital ships are needed for Force H. I a Congo for that. And the fast capital ships are needed. Uh, the three Congos, which are there ready to deploy force, you want to send two of those with, as, set, uh, as mentioned earlier, we go back here, with Akagi. Those two, destroy, those, two, uh, those two Congos with Akagi are sent to the Atlantic Force. So the Mediterranean is going to have a third carrier. They're probably also going to get some cruisers. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Japanese cruisers turn up. 8-inch and 6-inch cruisers. And I wouldn't be surprised if some destroyers turn up. Now this is going to change things to the Mediterranean fleet. What, at this point, if we consider... The, well, the whole scenario going on... When the Battle of Taranto is run, the the Royal Navy is deploying rather a large force wandering around. There's a whole massive operation going on. It's called Operation MB8, if you don't know. And it does actually involve Ark Royal and the Force H as well. One of the interesting things in this scenario is what you might... Uh, is either the, the Congo might go round Africa to join, or it might be... The Force H meeting up, the forces joining, includes a Congo going across to reinforce, the, or the Congos could be passed across to reinforce Force H and gone home. So it could well be that MB8 also involves a ca also involves ca you know, uh, I think it was again, it's Akaga. God, I've said the name so many times. I'm sort of Akagi. Going across to meet up with Ark Royal and taking her to her escorting free Congos with her while they're doing this crossover. It's all sorts of things. But basically at this point Cunningham ends up with traditionally during Operation MB8 and sort of the scenario around Toronto, ends up with having Barham, Berwick, Glasgow, those two cruisers, plus, of course, um, Ramleys wandering around, Warspite, reinforcing himself quite strongly. I can see that being matched by the Japanese. I could see there being roughly 30 destroyers, roughly 10 cruisers, and an air, along with the aircraft carrier. I could see that being the force they send to, for, uh, to reinforce the, the Royal Navy and Mediterranean fleet. And I could see that being a very welcome force, but that's going to have a big impact 
on Jap on Italian perceptions of operations. Because, again, this is 1940. This is before the fall of Greece, before the fall of Crete, before Taranto. Now, the British have a, cut a few cruisers. They have things like Exeter, etc. They don't have a lot of forces in 1940 deployed in the Far East watching the Japanese. They have some forces, but not a lot of them. So, Black Max says there's not going to be a same release as if, let's say, it was in 1941. Okay? So, again, I can understand why you're bringing up the British forces, what British forces are freed up by the Japanese not joining the war. But basically, as I said, it was more the Australian New Zealanders' forces which are freed up. And their worries, which was discussed earlier. And just usually, yeah, it's lovely to think about a decolonization movement growing in Japan in 1944, but where's it coming from? Even Yonai, as much as he is great in some ways, is not going to advocate for the decolonization of Korea. So, yeah, you know, I don't, that, that's a lovely idea to have, but it's not happening. And again, Britain is a decolonizing power at this point. They are turning their colonies into dominions and turning the empire into a commonwealth. But Britain's a lot further down the empire track and the economic growth track than Japan at this point. And yeah, they are going to release some of the pressure of pressure on Britain. What are majority of IGN fighters at the time? Zeros or claws? Now, here's the interesting thing. And so I actually had to work this out because I started thinking about Taranto. And... I typed that wrong, didn't I, earlier? Let's go check. Well, rather, not, not, not earlier, sadly enough. I typed this wrong earlier this week. This is because I was myself having fun. This is one of the reasons why I'm being quite type, uh, tight on the timeline with you all. Because I found myself, when I did some practices through this, I kept going over on the timeline and jumping off and then getting out of order. Because it does have such a massive impact, if we don't keep to the timeline, it's difficult. One of the things that's really interesting is with the aircraft, okay? So, one of the reasons, again, why only two carriers are deployed is because if you want to deploy the very best aircraft the Japanese have... Those aircraft are entering service. They don't have enough for all their carriers. So if you are just deploying two, you can get away with it. The vast majority has already been asked. Since the vast majority of their forces are clawed, but they have enough zeros, they can put them on these ship, these two carriers. So two carriers can take zeros. They can do that at this point. And so that's why I think that's one of the reasons why I, I, I keep sort of emphasizing the two carriers because of the limitations of their force, uh, their force strength for this point. Now, I've also added another possibility because as I said I keep going back to I think the Americans might get involved, but I think it'd be a ca it'd be sort of a naval involvement and be kind of limited forces. So, I actually did prepare two scenarios to discuss with you. There's the scenario if the Americans don't get involved. When you have a force of four sea gladiators, 15 full Mars, 21 zeros, 18 vowels, 18 kates, and 36 swordfish from Eagle, Soryu, and Illustrious. But there's also a scenario where a Yorktown class turns up, and I reckon it would probably be Enterprise, but it could be Yorktown. And um, that will probably bring with it 18 Douglas Devastators, 18 Brewster Buffaloes, potentially, as the Grum Wildcats actually historically don't end the service till December 1940. But again, if this one's going to war, maybe they push that? I don't know. Um, and then there's 36 Curtis SBC Helldivers, as the Douglas SBD Dauntless doesn't end the service again until very late 1940. Even, you know... It, about the same time as the um, 
Grumma Mog hats, though. So... They are A6M1s. Zeros, but they, 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 they would still be zeros. Yeah, the Kate is in... The, the, the back of the Kate's first source service in 948. Yes. So the Kate's fine, okay? The Kate is fine. The Kate's easy to get in. It's the Val and the Zero, which are the difficult ones. <laughs> um, is Admiral Yamato coming? I don't think so. Now, I don't think Yamato comes. The reason I don't think Yamato comes is I don't think uh, they will send him to this scenario. It's going to be interesting which Admiral they send where. Because I think Yamato is too senior to send as a subordinate for a joint force. But realistically, that's what they're doing at this point. They're integrating into British forces rather than sending a Japanese fleet to fight the war. So I wouldn't be surprised if Yamato is maybe sent to Britain to act as the Japanese consul and the Japanese integration into the Chiefs of Staff and for directing the strategic war effort. I could see him being sent there. But I could also see maybe Nagumo. I think I think he's sent to the Atlantic. He's sent probably to the uh, home fleet, and I don't think he is sent there. I think for the Japanese, honestly, I kept deciding who I think will be sent where. And it gets... You've got two options. You've got really um, Tama Yamaguchi, who could be uh, Tama, who could be sent there at this point, or Nobutaki Kondo. Um, I I have a sing suspicion it could be Kondo uh, because of his back, his experience and his operate his his career. But one of those will be sent to with Soryu. To be the commander of the Japanese forces in the Mediterranean. And yeah. It, it's going to be an interesting time because in any of this scenario, it's not good for the Italians. Because, you see, in the scenario, I would probably uh, probably work it out. The British would do a night strike with the swordfish. And that's probably it again. They do the swordfish night strike. And remember how bad 24 of them, uh, 21 of them turning up. Imagine what 36 of them turning up does. So at night, and then daytime is when I think the ja I think the Japanese come in at dawn. It's like Pearl Harbor. Um, and if the Americans are there, then it's a joint strike from the Americans and Japanese at dawn. Mainly because I don't think they're going to get their night their pilots night certified straight away. Interesting enough, both the Americans and Japanese, it's their scout pilots who are the night who are night, occasionally night trained, and those usually fly. Their dive bombers. So there is a possibility you could get the 18 Vals and 18 of the Hell Divers going in with the 36 Swordfish for the Night Strike. There is a possibility of that. Yamato has quite a good relationship with Britain as well, in, in a nice way, and he's the most senior. Also, the trouble is the, the one above him who's got a better relationship with Britain is Yonai himself. Uh, Yonai has quite a good impression with all of them, so Yonai can't go himself, so I think probably Yamato is sent. Because again, in this scenario, Britain's being the central hub. They're joining the alliance with Britain. So it's also going to be American officers sent to Britain, and that's where the joint alliance will be sent up, and the center of headquarters will be Britain. So you want Yamato de, because that's where the key negotiations are going to take place.
I don't think there's a diversionary raid in this scenario. I f well, if there is a diversionary raid in this scenario, there the wor this scenario gets worse if the Americans have both Enterprise and Yorktown join in. Because if Enterprise then joins the Taranto raid operation in the with the Mediterranean fleet, Yorktown probably joins Force H. So that means Ark Royal and Yorktown go doing the diversionary operation. Um, uh, look, Blackman Maximus. I, yes, you want. Uh, I did expect to have to have lots of people bring up their various favorite Japanese officers. Um, now, uh, so I did go through quite a few of them. Uh, with Tanaka, he's still a captain in 1941. So in 1940, he's not viable. You're looking for someone who's a rear admiral, maybe vice admiral in 1940. That's your problem. So a lot, again, a lot of the favourite officers from World War Two, who people like to quote, especially the junior ones, are just not senior enough in 1940 to go for these boats. This is. The biplane version, by the way, the Helldiver. This is the Curtis SBC Helldiver. The first one. Not the SBC to, uh, SB2C. This is the SBC. And, uh, yeah. That, that would have fun. Honestly, in this scenario, I do not see there being a Japanese, uh, an Italian Navy left much after Taranto. <laughs> this is this is not a good day at the office. Because anything that survives the night then gets hit by a dawn raid. And if it gets a dawn raid from both Soryu and Enterprise, I don't think there's any Italian ships which are going to walk away from that and not be years being repaired. You know, if you think about the damage done to Littorio, Littorio, after, you know, Littorio, after the Battle of Taranto, is quite literally holed in three places, and is in deep, deep trouble. She's resting on the surface. She's immobile. She's not going anywhere. If you have dive bombers and torpedo bombers gang up on her, she's going to be sunk properly. I mean, she's not going to be resting on the, on, on the seabed. She's going to be fully on the seabed. She's not going to sink anymore, but the damage is going to... Uh, there's going to be enough water damage, enough damage to her, that she might actually be a write-off. And it's going to be similar for the other Italian battleships damaged in the fight. And in nicest way, again, you have to remember, Dawn is when they are actually m removing all the anti-torpedo nets to try and get the ships which are not damaged or are free to go out. So imagine that. They've got the nets removed. They're trying to get the ships out through the harbour. And whoomp! In come the Japanese and the Americans. Honestly, I don't see any in Italian fleet any Italian fleet in a viable force surviving that scenario. Uh, I'd see Vittorio Veneto being damaged even more. Littorio's knocked out. The Italians, any ships which are trying to escape are going to get hit and hit hard. Now, if this is combined with the North... A so at this point, they're not able to resupply North Africa. So the North African campaign probably goes well for the British. And the Japanese. Remember, they'll be involved. And again, in this scenario, maybe the Americans have sent some troops to North Africa at this point, and they're slotting, uh, they're joining in because the Americans could send the troops across the Pacific, long way around to North Africa, or they could just send them down through the South Atlantic around the coast of Africa. The, either way, that's an option. Especially if Japan's already in the war. If America's deploying troops. I don't see America deploying ground force. I see them going quite navalness. Um, yes, they, they might find out the American torpedoes don't work. They might find out the Japanese torpedoes have issues at this point. That's all going to be a case. 
but it's going to still be a problem for the Italians because they're going to have dive bombers also coming in. There are probably going to be a few remarkable survivors. But the fact is, you've got enough devastators coming in, and you've also got a scenario here you've got to think about, is that, um, think about this. So, the Japanese torpedoes will probably work in this scenario, and they'll have had a couple of months working alongside the British, who will have helped them with their torpedoes as well. So whilst the American torpedoes might not do the job, there are also going to be, there could be in a dawn attack, 36 hell divers and 18, 18 valves dropping bombs. So that's, let's be honest, 54 dive bombers. And whilst you've got 18 Douglas Devastators dropping their torpedoes, you've also got 18 Kates. And this is all, this is all as long if the British haven't literally sent their, brought, got their pilots home from their night attack, put them to bed and woken them up a few hours later, or lit potentially, considering how naughty the British are occasionally with their pilots, the fact they're all dual trained, have brought as many pilots as they could along with them so they can then get the aircraft turned around and launch as part of the dawn strike themselves. I don't know, I think if you get, know if Gilio Cheshire gets her, still gets her plot armor. There is a real chance that if the Italians are losing in North Africa, their fleet gets damaged, there is a real chance that Mussolini, who was never the dictator that um, German, that Hitler was, and remember this is before, long before the Germans get as many forces into Italy as they did historically when there was the flip, Mussolini could well find himself falling from power. Remember, he has power as long as he's a winner. He gets support from people as long as he's a winner. If he starts losing, he loses his power. Yeah, uh, after Taranto, there is a good chance that Raiders now got the largest Axis surface fleet. But also, there's another problem. Because if you consider, if Taranto does decisively cripple the Italian battle fleet. What's going to happen? Well, think about all those forces which traditionally were in the Mediterranean, which traditionally were deployed to the eastern waters or by the American, you know, and, and Americans and Japanese forces available as well, will now be shifting to the Atlantic. So, November 1940 could turn into a very dark day, a very dark month for the Italians and the Germans. And if the Italians do switch sides, even if they go, you know, declare peace, declare neutrality, or, uh, you know, try and negotiate a separate peace. Which, to be fair, removing Mussolini, and then, again, their king comes in pretty handy, going, Oh, I've removed the dictator. I'm sorry, you know, then... He was who was put in power by the people, so I had to respect that. But he led us wrong, and the people have chosen differently now. And I'm your fellow monarch, Mr. M uh, fellow monarch, Mr. King, Mr. Emperor. Um, shall we? Uh, can I join the monarchs' alliance against dictators? As I've got rid of my own. Da 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 da. That could well happen. So it's, it, it's an interesting scenario, but it also means that if that happens in November 1940, that's going to change a lot of the 1941. If in 1941... If in 1940... The Italians have been knocked out of the war because they've lost in North Africa... And they've lost that. Uh, they lost their fleet. And let's be honest, if they lose their fleet, they can't resupply North Africa. Then a lot of 1941 starts to get very interesting. Very, very interesting. 
For example, perhaps Operation Compass doesn't happen. Or rather, maybe it does happen. But Operation Compass was originally the 12th of January 1941, and that was the assault on Tobruk. Now, there is a possibility that Mussolini, even losing the fleet, managed to stay in uh, stay control. But uh, I do not see, if Tobruk falls on the 21st of January 1941, I do not see him still surviving that. So, basically, he has a chance of managing to get peace on his terms. But if Tobruk and various things fall in 1941, there's a problem. But, of course... There are not going to be necessarily the German bases as soon in this scenario. Um, there's also going to be the fact that if if we consider uh, there was German a German aircraft managed to damage Illustrious after Taranto on the 10th of January 1941, and they take command of the air in 1941 because they move in there now. If the Japanese are there, A, there's going to be their fighters involved. If the Americans are there as well, well, A, you might not have Illustrious in that position, but B, you're going to have a very different scenario of all oh, the Fulmars are getting worn out because the Fulmars are then going to be backed up by Wildcats, maybe? And if the Americans do bring Wildcats over, do they bring the Wildcats over for the Royal Navy? So it does Illustrious now have Wildcats instead of Fulmars. So instead of running out of parts for a Fulmar, she's got Wildcats. Uh, they have Zeros, Wildcats, and Fulmars providing the air defense of their operations. That's a very different, especially if they're using British developer fighter control, that's a very different scenario. But that means both the Americans and the Japanese are going to be learning British fighter control, and they're going to be learning night attacks from the British. Alistair Crowell, Narvik's already happened. Sorry. Um, uh, the second and third battles are not... Uh, second and... Well, the the second... First, second and uh, third battles of Narvik took place... But uh, were over by the 8th of June, 1940. So, uh, unfortunately, without them joining before the 25th of June... There's no chance of them getting there. And even then, they wouldn't have got there before, you know... 19, uh, a lot later. Well, that is also the problem, because the Allies have the carriers in the Mediterranean, mostly to defend against air attacks and to counterbalance the, Jap uh, the Italian battleships. If the Italian battleships are out, then I'm going to be far more conservative in my operation of my carriers. And if the Italian Navy is being knocked out, that's going to also change some of the signs. It You might also see a lot more British involvement, in uh, fleet involvement, in terms of operations alongside the coast supporting the army. A lot more bombardments going on. So, I think Italy froze in the town. I think also that makes it interesting from the point of view of if does Germany deploy the Germany doesn't deploy the troops the sh the aircraft etc and things to to Italy they you know they historically did it because the Italians wanted uh, you know after the Battle of Toronto to reinforce and you know do those operations but I don't think they do it I do honestly think that Italy drops out by 19 uh, by at least latest the fall of Tobruk in 1941. Which also could mean that the German forces, depending on how Italy drops out, whether they join alliance or go neutral. If they join the alliance, then the German forces in Italy could find themselves being taken prisoner. Which leads us to the Atlantic. Now, historically, in January 1941, the twins go hunting. Now, whilst 1961, you have raised an interesting point. Uh, unless Hitler wants to fight to the German people, he'll sue for peace at this point. 
I don't think it's going to be for the Twins Go Hunting. Now, it's technically May 1941 when Bismarck goes hunting, but let's think about Operation Berlin. Now, they have a close run-in with Rodney. As we all know, Rodney does like to put on the accelerator shoes and try and prove that she can do more than 23 knots. And according to the Jones, we're estimating 26 knots was chasing them. We'll leave that to one side. But uh, the scenario is, what are they going to do? What are the Germans going to do? Well, if they go out, they're going to find a Royal Navy which has a Congo with Force H in reinforcing Renown, which is going to change how they act with Force H. Because let's be honest, if you've got Renown and a Congo, you probably are less worried about running into Sean Horse and Nisenau because those two together can probably take on Sean Horse and Nisenau. If you've got a pair of Congos up reinforcing the Royal Navy's forces escort looking for them and hunting for them, and and of course you haven't just got that, you've got Akagi. Potentially Hiryu. Potentially you've got Yorktown with Force H, and you've got potentially Saratoga or Lexington with the British fleet plus uh, potentially uh, well I'm just checking the exact dates for the you know so I can be 100% sure I did check this earlier um, it's the uh Yeah, well, you see, there's another couple of ships which might be joining in. There's another couple of ships which might be there. Uh, historically, they are commissioned in April and May 1941. But... So they probably won't be there. But the North Carolinas are an option as they are 20 knot fast battleships 28 knot fast battlesh uh, battleships but they the, technically they're commissioned a bit late so te this is why i haven't included the whole thing about them including but i wouldn't be surprised if you find lexington saratoga and some of the big heavy cruisers of the u.s navy sitting with the forces um so you might well have Hear you, you might have, uh, you, you will definitely have um, Akagi and probably Lexington or Saratoga backing up the British uh, the British fleets as part of the British forces, uh, the Battle of the Battle Forces, watching for the um, twins to go a hunting. So here is the problem. If you were sensible then in that scenario, would you wait till May 1941 when you could take out Sean Horse, Nice Now, and Bismarck? Guard in a really strong force. Potentially. Potentially you go out with just Sean Horse and Nice Now and see if they can break out into it. But again, think about the scenario. Think about the fact that you now have Furious. Victorious, possibly formidable, has gone to the Mediterranean, but possibly indomitable is available. Um, no, she's not quite, but Victorious certainly is. Uh, you will have, well, yeah, Victoria. You'll have Victorious. You'll have Furious. Uh, you could have. Akagi, Hiryu, maybe Lexington, Saratoga. So you've got roughly six carriers sitting there rotating around. You're going to have mm, Prince of Wales is still coming on, but you've got Duke of York. You've got Repulse. You've got Hood. You've got at least two Congos. And you've got Rodney, Nelson, 
Maybe the Americans are really nice and send to Colorado. There's also the fact that at this point you might find Nagato showing up as well in early 1941. Now, whilst I would love to do the whole part Toronto Part 2 and Wilhelmshaven approach, and I, I do see a lot of people putting it forward. The fact is, the German fleet wasn't spending a lot of its time in Wilhelmshaven. And they were mostly keeping either in the Norwegian fjords, which were a lot more difficult to attack because of the angles, etc. Um, or they were hiding in the further into the Baltic. And so there were problems because there was quite thick, heavy air defences. It wasn't like Taranto. Taranto was incredibly exposed. Because trust me, the Royal Navy would have done Wilhelmshaven if they thought they could get away with it at any point in World War II. They would have risked anything to do it. So the fact they didn't is because there wasn't usually enough targets there for, him to work, for it to be worthwhile. Now... Again, it's an interesting discussion about North Carolinas, is whether they could be sped up. Whether they could be sped up and so could be com commissioned earlier. The fact is, they are launched in June 1940, both of them historically. So, they're launched historically in June 1940, and both of them are ready in, in well... Uh, in 11 months and 10 months, respectively. So that's fairly quick. I don't know if you could get a ship for, uh, built and commissioned much quicker than that. So... I would say you have a choice. You either delay Berlin until you have Bismarck available. You do Bismarck or Berlin, but if you lose both of the twins, you're not going to do Rheinbung because Lutchens is dead and also is Hitler going to want to risk Bismarck? Sharnos and Neisenau getting sunk will be bad enough. Losing Bismarck, that will be a huge loss of face. And loss of, uh, uh, you know, loss of status. Or if you wait for all three, the trouble is if you wait for all three, you're not doing it before May 1941. And at that point, Italy's probably out the war. What are you going to do? Well, you know, what's your options? You have exactly zero options at that point. And Germany seeing see, uh, Germany suing for peace is a real possibility. Uh, Graf Zeppelin, it might, but I don't think it's going to. It cannot change much because honestly. For that, the Germans would have to settle on the design. They might push forward. It was post Taranto. They did really push forward with the carry and did start to put some work. But they did that with the limited resources they had available at that time. And that was with Italy in the war. And that was with access to some key goods from Japan, including rubber. Um, which the Japanese were managing to get through various scenarios to drop off in Germany. Uh, so in, in, that is just not going to happen. Clark. Actually, all the Japanese cavalry ships available in so ships like... In the nicest way, Steve, it's very nice you say all the Japanese ships available in 1940, but realistically, it's three of the Congos. I don't... That might... They might send some ships into some refits, but I don't know how much... Whether they do so. Nagata and Mutsu come in in probably 1941. So maybe some ships get sent in for refits in 1941. I could see Nagato and Mutsu showing up and them going, let's send Nelson or Rodney into a refit. Uh, 
Um, I Let's be honest, the German Navy might put forward a plan, but again, is Raider going to put forward a plan of sending the Twins out into that scenario? In a nice way, when he sends them out on Operation Berlin, the number of ships which are available which can, ca which can catch him are Renown, Repulse, Hood, and... HMS King George V? Historically, Prince of Wales isn't commissioned until January 1941. And we all know the state she's in in May 1941. So... It's a... Scenario here. No, sorry. It's uh, Steve Clark. Any relation to Dr. Clark? Doctor. Actually, no. I think Steve is probably the only Clark with an E who we haven't yet, who, was, who watches this channel, who is not related to me. Um, at least we haven't found any relationship, a, a relationship to me. I'm the only male in 40 cousins, but then it goes up and there's a whole layer of um, other family beyond that and beyond that. So who knows? There might be a connection on my dad's side, but the main connect, uh, main family I have are the, the, the my, my mum's side. That's the larger sort of pool of family that I tend to uh, uh, working with. Um, potentially, but again, one of those hoods, one of those Congos goes to Force A, uh, Force H. But again, with Renown and a Congo at Force H. That gives Force H a lot of striking power. Add in USS Yorktown as well as Ark Royal, and suddenly Force H becomes a very scary force. I mean, who wants to run into that force? Hello, I'm HMS Ark Royal. Hello, I'm USS Yorktown. Hello, I'm Haruna. Hello, I'm Renown. I'm the grandma of this group. No, actually, she's not. Haruna's older than her. When you adopt Steve Clark. Uh, my cooch, I'll leave that up to my mother. But yeah, I do think you see some refits, but also I think you see the war ending a lot earlier. I do not see Hitler giving in. I do not see him surrendering, but I do see him grinding to a halt. If he, if Italy doesn't just go neutral, but actually joins alliance, does a full World War One scenario on him. Or 1943 scenario on him. In many ways. And if... Um, it happens before he's invaded Greece and taken Greece. Then he could find himself with a southwest front to deal with. He could also find that there is a liberation of France launched from Italian controlled territories of France. Because remember, there are some areas of France which are under Italian control. And if you can land the troops in, the Allied troops in there. You can move up and liberate France with a lot less trouble than doing a landing against the opposed defences. He hasn't built the defences on the Atlantic Wall yet. Um, it's going to be interesting. Now, do I do a refit to fix up on a hood to fix up her engines? Potentially, but potentially not, because honestly, again, I think a lot of you are preparing for a Battle of Denmark Strait scenario. I don't see that happening. Let's let's sit there and go uh, think about it, think through what's going to happen in a, in the scenario of um, Bismarck if they don't come out to May 1941. Yeah, Hood might well be in refit. But the reason she'll be in refit is because the British will have, at that point, Prince of Wales and King George V. They'll have two Congos sitting there. They might well have Repulse still hanging around in the background, or they might have a wandering off elsewhere. And so that's their four fast ships. And so instead of it being Prince of Wales and 
Hood turning up. There'll be Prince of Wales on a Congo and King George V on a Congo. And, it, and there's going to be a lot more carriers going around. So if you have Lexington and Saratoga, as well as Victorious and Furious... And all, and that's if that's if 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 you have it delayed in any way, shape, or form. Okay. If the Italians drop out of World War Two in 1941, well, I probably bring you probably bring Force H up to support it. So you'd suddenly have Renown up as well. You'd have Ark Royal. You'd have the Yorktown, uh, USS Yorktown, and the Third Congo. So suddenly you have three Congos renowned, the two King George V's, and that's your fast capital ships. It's, it changes the scenario dramatically. Hood might be in refit. She might not be. And the Mediterranean fleet is free to head up out. Again, you find all sorts of things happening at this point. Nagato, Mutsu coming along and uh, doing sorts of things. So, yes, they're 26 and a half knot ships. But again, if they're there with the home fleet, do you need. Uh, Nelson and Rodney might be able to get a refit. And the other thing is do you honestly, if you're a radar, recommend in that scenario you send the ships out? Think about it from the other perspective. Think about the sheer number of Japanese heavy cruisers which could be turning up. And the British heavy cruisers which are freed up from the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And the, and the, and the Far East and the 6-inch cruisers as well. Think about all the destroyers, the submarines. I haven't got into much discussing Japanese submarines, but if the Japanese have sent their submarine forces to reinforce the British in the Mediterranean, and if the Italians drop out the Mediterranean, then those submarines are probably streaming through the Straits of Gibraltar. I honestly don't know if I see... The Germans actually sending these ships out. They might well decide a fleet in being sitting in Norway is far better than a fleet in reality. But there again, the Allies aren't having to do the Arctic convoys. Yeah, Knight. Why are you bringing up that as a lane? Okay, yes, but... I, I I haven't watched as a lane, so um, that's a bit lost to me, and I I don't know enough about as a lane to really comment. So, the Atlantic, I don't see happening as it did historically in 1941. Which means... Yeah, and as Sean has just pointed out, there is a possibility they hold off on the refits entirely because once they've sunk the Germans, they can get their... Uh, they can get their... Surf they can get their refits done at their leisure. Realistically, the course of World War Two changes dramatically. But also realistically, the Mediterranean becomes the proving ground for a lot of technologies. And where either the Japanese and the British learn alongside each other a lot, or the Americans and the Japanese learn alongside each other. American, Japanese and Brits learn alongside each other. If I was the Americans, I hope it's the latter. Because the Japanese, after having worked out the kinks in their force structure and their sh their designs and ideas for night operations, and got radar up and running and all sorted out, after having worked out the issues with that and the, it built up the infrastructure to manufacture that, and got that enough ships, that suddenly changes a lot of the problems for the Americans when it comes to night fighting. 
I sort of, I, I know you're making a point, but you're making a point I don't understand. That's the point I was making. And it does release all sorts of forces. And again, the it's, uh, again one of the things you might see is the Japanese getting a whole load of ships fitted up with Aztec for anti-submarine warfare operations. Again, the Germans had U-boats which they sent to the Mediterranean. They got into the Mediterranean. They never got out of the Mediterranean. The USN still do build Iowa's. Yes, Sean Steve Clark. Hang on. Excuse me. I have been had a dog sent down in the rain. I'm not sure why I've had a dog sent down in the rain. I'm sure I'll get a message at some point. Hello! Hello, you've come to say hello, have you? you you've come to say hello. Okay, alright. Hello, yes, you're, you're cute. Uh, are you taking over the stream? Oh! Right, I will get you a bickies. I, I will get you a bickies. You don't have to stru squash me! I will get you a bickies! Ow! I'm squished! I supplied the bickies as requested. No, there's no need to hurt me. Oh. Oh. Yes, it's the senior fluffy research assistant. Oh. So. Sleep well, Team Locker. So, pretty much, how does this change the, well, the course of World War II? As said, it makes it over a lot quicker because sheer weight of fire against the Italians, you've got no Far Eastern deployments or issues, so you can just focus on Europe. And Hitler could probably still... I'm not sure about... See, the thing is, Hitler gets involved in Greece mostly to support the Italians. If the Italians are knocked out the war and not involved in Greece... And not involved and lost North America, North Africa. Does he still get involved in Greece? Does he still do that whole operation? He might do. He might not. They could certainly be reinforced. Yes, the ferocious poodle in its natural habitat. Oh, good lord, hello. Yes, you're gorgeous. So, it's. <sighs> It's at this point it starts to get well beyond the ability of doing alternate history and it's going almost by instinct. Because it does Hitler, as we'll already discuss, get a 9mm resignation? Or does he sue for peace? What does he do? I think he will certainly try and fight on. Or after all, he's sure he's a great power. Great powers do not get war declared on them. They declare war. So he might have preempted even the American um, potentially getting involved by declaring war on them. He might, you know, go, well, you know, Japan's joined. The next ones who are going to join, I'm sure, are the Americans. So I will declare war on the Americans because Japan's declared war on me. And that would have been a great, great insufferance for him to be declared war on by the Japanese. I could see that of causing him trouble. And that could have, of course, solved all Roosevelt's issues. Um, but it is probably a coup by the army. Which solves it. And then the thing is, there might be others who wish to step up from the Nazis, but I don't think that. I think that causes maybe an internal civil fight. Um, so, yeah. If there's no invasion of Greece, Yugoslavia, would Romania and Bulgaria be involved in war at all? Perhaps, potentially not. Potentially, they do a Spain. And there's also the scenario that if America, Japan, and Britain are linking up, duh, and considering the advice he already gets from Canaris, what does Franco do? Does Franco even join in on the pile in on Germany? Especially if the if the Allies walk through Italy, Italy controlled France to liberate France, does Spain also join in? They're not really in a fit state to, but they might decide it's in their best interest to. 
The reality is, at this point, if Italy's knocked out the war, if Stalin doesn't join the war, he's going to feel he's going to be on the outside of the peace decisions. So, at this point, he's probably joining, which is going to mean that Germany's going to be fighting on all sides and surrounded with everyone in the world ganging up on him. In which case, I do see Hitler being removed. Because by that point, they are in deep ship, aren't they? They're in deep ship. You don't know anything about deep ship, do you? Oh, good lord, no. Oh, you're trying to get up in my lap again. You're not as small as you think you are. Oh, good god, you're not. Oh, frigate. Hello, gorgeous. Yes. Oh. Hello. Oh. So, yeah, I think the war is over rather quickly. I then think, though, there is possibly still another war later on. It's going to depend on how the peace is managed, because these are still coming. And these are going to be the reason why a whole nother generation of battleships are built. Despite the carriers doing all the carriers do, another generation of battleships will be built because of Yamato and Mushashi. And probably their sisters. Because they will get built. Shinano might well come out as a battleship. After all, there will have been some battleship fights. There would have also been carrier strikes, but there will have been some battleship fights. I'm getting in lots of kisses for some reason. Or am I just dirty and deciding to lick me clean? What are you deciding here? What is it? I don't know. At least he's not one of the really big breeds. Yeah. You good boy. You're a very good boy, aren't you? Yes, you are. Alright, let's do... Normally, I, I wouldn't do this, but as you all haven't seen him in a while... Hello, yes, you can be full screen on the camera. Oof. What are you going after now? Hey. You also see how messy the office is in one corner. Hello. Ooh, hello. You expecting someone to come collect you? I don't think they will. They'll, they'll come collect you in a bit. Are you enjoying this? Right. He, of course, is very expensive in biscuits, he feels. So, yeah. He's a, he's a fluffy research assistant, of course, and he works for biscuits. Oh! And, oh! He's not eating, is he? Well, he enjoyed coming out to say hello to everyone. Yeah, so do you want him? Yes, but he won't come with the waterfall. Oh. He's enjoying that. Yes. So that's why he sent to me, to see if he would eat a biscuit. Ah, now the cunning plan is revealed. And he's knocked a small pile of things over the floor, so I'm just clearing that up. <laughs> this makes him hungry. <laughs> no, he hasn't been eating enough lately. We've been worrying about him. He still eats biscuits off me, but he's um he's not always eating for my mum and sister, and it's worrying them. <sighs> Honestly... I think it's because he knows that if he puts on a thing, they will hand feed him. Whereas he's about likely to get hand fed from me as he is to receive extra bonus Christmas presents. I No, I give him presents all year round. He's not getting extra bonus Christmas ones. Um, he doesn't need more than the three his brothers are going to get. His brother gets, so I get that. They both get the same number. Um, three new cuddly toys every Christmas. And he definitely doesn't get ham fed. It's a case of, there's your food, eat it. If you're very, very ill, I might might help you, but you're not, uh, not happening otherwise. But no, he he, he, um, he does like the finer things in life and treatment if he can get things he can get away with. It. 
I do. I do wonder how next generation CVs might look in this scenario. It's going to be designed to build their Mildew Welcome. Mildews and Super Tires should be fun. Oh, it will be fun. There might be a very... Again, in Dice Way, with the Mediterranean experience, it might be an emphasis on the armor deck. They might be looking at the Illustrious class, especially if some of them got hit, and they're looking at the damage they've taken from maybe things like Flea Corks X and the Midway. Sort of, especially if... If you have a scenario, that a historic attack which hits Illustrious, and she survives and goes, if, let's say, Soryu gets hit and gets severely damaged or even sunk, or the, something happens to Enterprise, or let's say both of them get severely damaged and are knocked out for ages, and then Illustrious is able to be quickly repaired because they're on the deck, that's going to cause a very different approach, isn't it? How old is the poodle? This is gonna. This is gonna. Ooh, how old is he? Now, this is something I should really, really easily remember. But the trouble is, he came pre-COVID, and time over COVID had sort of fused those years into one. So, I want to say six, but it could be seven. Yeah, there could be a whole discussion on how to do damage control. The reality is, though, the world will end up being very different. There will end up being, if there is a treaty after this to decide the world, the powers that are going to be deciding it are going to be the powers who are involved in the war. If the Soviets didn't join the war, then there's going to be other issues. There's going to be a lot of other issues for them. You could end up with an anti-Soviet alliance being formed, especially if the Soviets, as the communist dictatorship, are pushing things into China, etc., and Japan can market its anti-China, its operations in China as being anti-communist. That could be all sorts of interesting, fun things going on there. I also think that you're going to have reactions from both Britain and America. This, one of the, the things is, this war, if it's significantly shorter, and if we think about that, if this war ends, as I think it does probably sometime in 1941, then you've not damaged Britain the same way as you have done historically. Do you haven't, Britain hasn't run up the bills it has historically. Um, there is going to be a lot less death, a lot less destruction, and Britain's going to be able to build back from a far firmer position. I think Germany might find itself an interesting scenario. If they, if they surrender without being invaded, without there being necessary to be an invasion of Germany, there is going to be a breakup. How Germany gets broken up is going to be very interesting. Now, to liberate Soviet Poland, that's a different matter. If the Soviets haven't joined the Allies, they could find themselves in the next target because the British and Americans can assist Germany leaves its Polish territories. And they could therefore insist that the Soviets do. The Soviets could, of course, market that as, oh, we were in Poland to defend ourselves. We had to agree with them to defend ourselves. Or they could try and hold on to it for the strategic depth, in which case they could find themselves in a war versus the Brits, the Americans, and the Japanese. That could see nuclear weapons used for the first time. Now, without the second Sino-Japanese war starting, then Chiang Kai-shek is going to be in a better position anyway to try and actually 
organize uh, Ch organize China, and he's not going to be as weakened by fighting here, fighting the Japanese in order to face the communists. And if the next thing is we are now anti-communist, and because of Stalin, then suddenly Chiang Kai-shek could find himself being supported in China by the Japanese, by the British, and by the Americans against Mao. Which could have all sorts of interesting things for histories. Uh, Richards, the, 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 the trouble is the Nationalists didn't really have a choice about deciding with the Japanese or not. The Japanese were going after both. The thing is, the Nationalists tried to fight the Japanese far harder than other factions in China did, who did lip service to fighting the Japanese in considering the size of the forces and the size of the effort they expended. But I don't want to get into that too much because I have enough fun dealing with the various people who come out every time I talk on Bruch, uh, on bilge pumps. Now, Sean Quigley, you've just put in your question about t uh, historical treatment of principles of war in occupied areas. Well, if you consider in this scenario, the Japanese aren't going to be taking a lot of... Uh, the prisoners of war occupied areas are mostly going to be jointly occupied, and the prisoners of, wars, uh, prisoners of war will probably be de dealt with jointly. So, let's be honest, the Japanese camps are the other side of the world. Do the Japanese want to move these people back there, or do they want to drop them off in the British prisoner of war camp in North Africa, etc.? So, yes, it probably does temper the treatment, but it might not change their minds as to the treatment. I think the bigger difference you're going to have is coming from Yonai and above, going, we have to act as a great power. We are in a great power alliance. We want to be treated as a great power. We are a great power. Therefore, we have to do as a great power does. And this is what the great powers are doing. Uh, you have to remember when they were doing their, when they were sort of in World War II, they were trying to reform, historically, they were trying to reform what a great power was. They were turning the great power into them. Well, in this scenario, they are becoming a great, they are a great power, so therefore they're acting as a great power. So I really do think the scenario changes. I don't think the whole war changes. And I think one of the scenarios you see coming out of this is, you know, remember that great big meeting you have of, of um, you, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin? Well, you'd have Yonai, Roosevelt, and Churchill... But I think you'd also have a pic... you probably also in that picture perhaps have the Emperor and the King. Um, especially, you know, it might well be considered necessary. The Emperor doesn't usually do these things and it wouldn't usually take part in photographs and things in that period. But it might well be considered necessary by all involved for the Emperor, especially if Italy's King's coming along. Run on. Um, is it possible for Stalin to attempt to strike the Japanese whole line, whole line and swat the bulk of the fleet as way? With what? That's the problem. With what? And the bulk of the fleet isn't a way. We left Ryujo back there. We left other ships back there. Um, these two are hanging around in that area for most of the period. Um, he has no navy in the Far East, so he really can't do anything. And, yeah, he has, theoretically, he could have bomber aircraft attack, but again, there is going to, the huge bulk of the Japanese forces are still going to be back in Japan, uh, Japanese territory. Uh, 
Hello, Paul from Chicago. So, as always, after this, I will be on Discord chatting away. I look forward to it. And... Yeah, it's 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 a fun scenario to work through. I hope you enjoyed it. It was quite a lot of... Uh, there was... I have to say the bulk of the research for me for this one did go have to get into maxing out to working out through the timelines. It was a lot of time working through the timelines. So you thought the Japanese may have another go at their invasion of the Soviet Far East as a piece of pie. Well, honestly, if the ja if the um the, the interesting scenario you might get here, and don't take wrong, if they move on and Germany's giving up its part of Poland and then they turn to a, a Russia and go, you have to give up your part of Poland, and Russia doesn't, well, it could be an American Japanese invasion of Eastern, of, um, Eastern Russia. It could be, you know, both of those invading. And that makes it a very different scenario from an invasion perspective. And that could be taking place while, let's say, the British and the European powers maybe do a push through Germany. With perhaps the German army, uh, the now allied German army, uh, after the truce, making up for the uh, previous efforts by joining in on the operations. So, yeah, that that could well be... L let's put it this way. The Soviets might feel they're compelled to give up Poland because of the potential worst-case scenario of having a massive inj invasion in the East and a massive invasion in the West. Nice to everyone. In any scenario where N3 and G3 are built, there is no scenario where I see a 15-inch Vanguard class coming into service, no matter what its weight or tonnage. If the Kriegsmarine doesn't sort you with the twins, Bismarck and doesn't get turpits before the Hitler's doubled. Um, does the Royal Navy order the German Navy to sell to in turn and discover flow like the high fleet? Probably. That's probably where those four ships end up. Scarpa flow. Come on, Cameron. With a short war and no Japanese threat, do you see the shipping around India being kept at enough level level to move the food? I answered this earlier in the video, but yes, I did say that earlier in the video. I may gave a full explanation of that. How else? Where will India be in this scenario? Part of the British Empire? Probably working through various things, but the Indian Army will probably be heavily involved in every oper in pretty much all the operations. Basically, if you're the Soviet Union in that scenario, finding yourself and you manage to rig it so you end up getting invaded from both sides, um, basically you would mm, they would be joined to another object by an inclined plane wrapped helically around an axis. I don't see cruisers getting guns larger than 12-inch guns, even in a scenario where you've got 16.5-inch, 18-inch armed battleships, purely from the point of view of logistics and supporting the sheer volume of ships you need, which are cruisers. Post-war is going to depend on the relationships built up during the war and how they work.
Um, Knights hmm. Declare for one, the thing is, cruisers are always more about the volume of numbers. Battleships are about fighting the battle fleet. Molinus, in this whole history, what do you see happening navy wise in the 50s? Uh, probably the introduction of jet aircraft, the eventual development of the angled flight deck. Carriers growing again, but I see battleships. Fast battleships being a big fast as a part of task, task groups for a lot longer. I think, honestly, you could see them still being part of task groups up until about 1970s. It's, it's 1970s, 80s, so as in new classes being built. So I could see new classes of fast battleships being built in the 50s and maybe even the 60s. I could see them still building those ships into the 60s. Because the big losses of Force Z and all the other things haven't happened, which stick in the craw of everyone, and the fast capital ships will have been a core part of the fleet's operations. And if you did, if the Germans did come to sea, and if it did end up being a big battle between, I don't know, let's say the Germans come to sea after Renown, etc. released, and you end up with Renown, King George V, and two Naga uh, two Congos versus maybe you end up with Ren uh, let's say Renown, Prince of Wales, King George V, all three Congos actually versus Bismarck, Scharnhorst, and Neisenau. You end up with that as a fight. That's going to be seen to demonstrate their requirement because that fight could still happen. Colin Cameron, it'll be interesting to see a Japanese historian's reaction to this video. Hmm. See, realistically, I've put this on. To me, Japan always looks like it could flip on a coin. Japan can go the independent route, or it could go this route. Depending on who's in charge. Yonai is very anti-war with America and Britain because he doesn't think Japan can win it. This way, he can get the results of a war with Japan, with Britain and America, i.e. the expansion and the prestige and the security, without having to fight a war. His decision is made for more made for him by the Second Sino-Japanese War. Without that being a scenario, he's okay to put. He can push forward. What about missile development? That's gonna be interesting. You see, a lot of missile development spreads from a lot of the rocket development, which happens later in the war when dive bombers are replaced by rocket bo rocket aircraft. One of the interesting things is this period is dive bomber is still going to be king when the war ends. 1941, the dive bomber is still a very useful, very practical asset. 1943, it stops being so. And so you start shifting magically to, to rockets. So, yeah, th these things could all be very interesting and very different. Right, then. So, I'm going to say last questions. What have we got coming up next week in the lives? I, I, I cannot remember. Let me just check. I know I've got to run the... Um, the Basically, I've left it because people keep... Uh, thank you to people who've joined the um, you, the patron this week. And thank you to people who've been joining. That's why I've left the patron suggestions up instead of putting turning into a patron vote. Because people have kept joining. And I wanted to give people about 24 hours or so from the last jo person joining before I run the vote. So I made sure I got all the suggestions in. So thank you to everyone who's joined. And if anyone wants to join, please do. Because what I'll do is I will now run the patron suggestions into a vote... I will do it on Saturday, a Sunday. I will start it on Sunday, on the 21st, and it'll be over by the 28th. 
Um, next week's live topic is, I think it's USS Triton? Yeah. The first submerged circumnavigation of the world. Which I thought would be a cool one to do. I, I, I know there aren't many who, anyone suggests that's on a Patreon one, it's a personal one, it's a year of the aircraft carrier, but I just thought it would be a cool one to do. Carl, I know the Soviets used aircraft rockets in the 1930s, but they were absolutely terrible. And there's a reason why they stopped using them. Because they weren't working. It took years of them to get them viable. And the thing is, war hastened their introduction and then hastened the transition from dive bomber to rocket launch aircraft. If you don't have war going on in 1943, rockets probably don't get introduced into active operation till the 1950s. But it's fine. I do understand your urge to push forwards, but the trouble is there is the fact that without war as this pressing need, usually these things do not get implemented that quickly. As I've often said, war gives the, appear the appearance of a technological surge. But that's mainly because we more, uh, what happens in war is you stop developing technologies and you take the technologies you've developed them and t develop it into I and implement them. War is not a, sp uh, not a stimulus for the development of new technologies. It's the stimulus for implementation of technologies. That's what happens in wartime. If you know, if you don't have the pressure of war, you usually take years to implement things because you want to be absolutely sure before you do so. All right, thank you very much, Aaron. So, thank you to Colonel. Don't think I've seen him before. Hello. Thank you, Ins Morrison. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jacob, Black Morrison, everyone for watching. Thank you all. Uh, next week's recorded video is Conception, Operation, Conclusion of HMS Hermes and Hosho Langley. And how are the G40 as well? And, um, yeah, I uh, the, the video for tomorrow is mostly record, is recorded. I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. Uh, it might get adapted in the morning, but it, it will get it's recorded. It's fine. And the video for Saturday's done, so that's all loaded up. Um, I hope you enjoyed that one. That is, of course, the long patrol on what happens if Battenberg remains as first sea lord. And I've included all sorts of details which I didn't put in the live because the thing is, because I have adjust to have to adjust for live for the questions. I always try and keep it to 12 slides in the live. I had about 19 slides prepped for Battenberg's video. So those slides went back into the Long Patrol. Thank you, Alistair Crowell. Thank you, VM Williams. Thank you, everyone who's been watching. Hope you enjoyed. As said, I'll be on Discord in a bit. I'm going to have a quick comfort break and check in on the fluffs. But then I'll be on Discord in a bit, and I look forward to chatting with you all. Hope you enjoyed this evening, and... Take care. It is an interesting scenario. I have to say, I didn't get much into the effect of Japanese pilots turning up for the Battle of Britain. But if you consider the British were storing aircraft throughout the Battle of Britain as the reserve in case the Battle of Britain was lost, they do have spare aircraft available to go and put, on, put pilots in. And if they have the extra pilots, they probably would do it. And Japanese pilots, they're not a bad, they are a very good group. Give them something like a Spitfire, and let's be honest, the difference between a Spitfire and a Zero is not as far in terms of its flying as we might think. It, they're both very nimble, very light aircraft. And I wouldn't be surprised if some Japanese pilots got ace in flying Spitfires. Enjoy, and I hope you like the butterfly wings. And I'll be recording a long patrol for this probably next Tuesday or Wednesday at some point. And, um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed it all. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and have fun. Oh, good lord, it's been three and a half hours.
That's not normal. 